Well, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon or good morning or good evening, depending on where you are. Welcome or welcome back to the 37th annual and first virtual International Churchill Conference. I'm Alan Packwood and I'm going to be your host today. The conference is entitled Churchill in Adversity. It marks 80 years since the Battle of Britain and the Blitz, but it is also taking place against the backdrop of a global pandemic. And this means, of course, that sadly we are entirely virtual. One silver lining of that is that it means we can reach a truly global audience. And I'm thrilled to be able to announce that as of this morning, we have over 3,000 registrations to this conference, and we believe that over 4,000 people tuned in to watch yesterday. Of course, there's still time to, to beat yesterday's figures and to raise those totals. Yesterday, we looked at leadership. We looked at painting and legacy. And yesterday's activities were all based primarily here in the UK. But the International Churchill Society is a global organisation and it has its strongest presence in North America, by which I mean both the United States and Canada. The organisation partners with George Washington University, where there is a National Churchill Library and Centre, and with Westminster College Fulton, Missouri, the site of Churchill's famous Iron Curtain speech and the home of America's National Churchill Museum. And today we're going to be having sessions from both of those places. But for those of you joining us for the first time today, or perhaps for those of you who need a reminder uh, on how it worked yesterday, let me take just a few moments to show you around our website. Click on the program button to see exactly what is happening when. We're going to be on air for the next four hours and we have a packed agenda for you. Click on the speakers button to see more about who will be participating. We're extremely grateful to all the sponsors who've made this event, this conference possible. And I want to mention two people um, this morning. Lawrence Geller, who was here with the introductions yesterday, and Philip Beckman and Erin Beckman, um, who um, are wonderful supporters of the International Churchill Society as a whole, but also um, particularly of the American National Churchill Museum, to which we will be going later. Um, if you want to support the work of the International Churchill Society in staging events like this, then do show your appreciation by clicking on the donate button at the top of the screen. But if you do so, make sure you come back and watch the proceedings. We're a, a charity, a non-profit, and any monies received will be going to support our ongoing educational projects, of which you will see and hear more later today. We do want to make your experience as interactive as possible, so you can email in your questions and your comments using 2020 at winstonchurchill.org. You can also use um, social media, but again, make sure you keep watching. Um, we're also going to be asking you quiz questions, and indeed, having a short Challenge Churchill quiz later this afternoon. This will be a, a chance for you to test your knowledge against some of our Churchill team. So let me explain how that works. Clicking the Take the Quiz button when prompted, or scrolling down, will take you to our interactive quiz screen where you can click on your choice of multiple choice answer and see how other people are voting in response to the given question. Alternatively, you can just shout at the screen or you can print out our quiz PDF to record your own answers as we go on. Most of the questions today are going to be for fun, but there will be two where you can email in for prizes, so do look out for those. So let's give it a, a try and let's have a test run now. Here is a question. This question was supplied to me by Randolph Churchill, Winston's great grandson. And the quiz question should now be appearing in the interactive quiz screen. And the question is this. What was Winston Churchill's middle name? 
Was it A, Leonard, B, Spencer, C, Charles, or D, Jack? So record or shout or click on your choice of answer now. What was Winston Churchill's middle name? And the answer is Leonard. He was named for his maternal grandfather, Leonard Jerome. Spencer is part of the Spencer Churchill family surname. Charles is another common Churchill family first name and Jack was Winston's brother. But the correct answer, Leonard. And there will be more of these quiz questions later on. But let's now move to our first session. Yesterday, we heard about leadership in adversity from two senior British politicians, Sir John Major and Lord Haig. So I think it's only fair that now we cross the Atlantic and go to the White House. This next session is largely pre-recorded, not live. So do send your comments to us using the email, but sadly, we won't be able to put them to the participants. But here to tell us more, and very much live, is someone who is already known to many of you. He's a long-serving volunteer with the International Churchill Society. Here is Justin Reich, and I'm delighted that Justin is our newly appointed director of the International Churchill Society in the US, and also director of the National Churchill Library and Center in Washington, DC. So across the pond and over to Justin. Thank you, Alan. Uh, I am honored to open this second day of our first virtual conference. And I echo uh, Alan's comments uh, and congratulations regarding the over 3,000 registrants that we've had across the globe. Thank you for joining us. As Alan said, if you missed any of the wonderful sessions yesterday, these sessions are being recorded and they will be available soon to watch on demand. Uh, as Alan introduced, my name is Justin Reich and I am the executive director of the US branch of the International Churchill Society. I'm also the program director of the National Churchill Library and Center at George Washington University. Before I introduce this next segment, I'm proud and excited to share an important update from Washington. As of today, the National Churchill Library and Center at the George Washington University has been renamed to the National Churchill Leadership Center. This name change reflects the center's focus on using Churchill as a case study for effective leadership in the past and inspiration for leaders in the future. After the upcoming segment, I will be joined by Geneva Henry, who is the Dean of Libraries and Academic Innovation at George Washington, and we will discuss this exciting development in the Churchill world. So to kick off this new direction from our nation's capital, this upcoming segment is the first installment of a new Churchill Leadership interview series presented by the National Churchill Leadership Center. I am pleased to introduce United States National Security Advisor, Ambassador Robert C. O'Brien, who recently took time out of his very busy schedule to discuss how Churchill's legacy continues to inspire current leaders in a conversation with ICS board member, Mitchell, Ambassador Mitchell B. Reese. Please note, as Alan said, that this was a pre-recorded interview. So unfortunately we can't answer questions but please do send your comments to our email, which is 2020 at winstonchurchill.org. Enjoy. Mr. Ambassador, I understand that you are a long time admirer of Winston Churchill. And I would love to hear, what does Winston Churchill mean to you? What aspects of his long career do you find most appealing? Yeah, so, so there are many, but I think uh, in this job or in previous jobs, and, and you've been in these positions as well, uh, uh, Ambassador, the, uh, it, it's his resoluteness, it's his resolve. And uh, yeah, I just think of the, the Harrow speech in uh, 1941, where he, he basically says to the students, if you can and distill the lessons learned from that, that prior year uh, into one statement, then, you know, and never give in, you know, never give in, never, 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 and nothing great or small, large or petty. Uh, never give in except uh, to convictions of honor and good sense. Uh, never yield to force. Never yield to the apparently overwhelming might of the enemy. 
And uh, I, I think that's a lesson for, for all of us just in our daily life, but also uh, for those of us that are in public service and, and have to face uh, you know, some of the challenges that uh, may not be as great as, uh, as Sir Winston faced, but, uh, but nevertheless, uh, it can be daunting. Well, I think you anticipated my next question, which was, what lessons do you think that uh, people in your position and other world leaders can derive from his example, from his writings uh, over the years? Yeah, so so he had such a it's it's a great question. It's a tough question though too, uh, isn't it? Because he had such a, a long and varied uh, uh, career and, and life, you know, from from his early years to to even his later years. There there are examples and and uh, and lessons you can learn from from each one of those. Uh, you know, I think of I, I I wrote an article a few years ago, probably ten years ago, in the, during the last administration, we were in the midst of defense sequestration. And uh, we're kind of our lead from behind and strategic patience approach uh, to the world. And uh, the Ukraine had been uh, invaded by Russia, and and it had a it had kind of a 1930s feel to to the the moment. And so the things that I focused on, I wrote in this article. You know, and again, you you always go to his speeches, right? As you know, mm-hmm. uh, after the the onslaughts, uh, when when he had a, a, a merry little band of you know four or five parliamentarians that were supporting him. And he came into the parliament and he said, a country like ours, and this resonated with us today as Americans, a country like ours, possessed of immense territory and wealth whose defense has been neglected, uh, cannot avoid war by a continuous display of Pacific qualities or ignoring the fate of victims of regression elsewhere. And, and so that seemed appropriate uh, a few years back. He you know, uh, went on to say in the same speech, if, moral, if mortal catastrophe should overtake the British nation and British empire, historians of a thousand years hence will still be baffled uh, by the mystery of our affairs, and and never understand how a victorious nation uh, you know could have allowed this to happen, and, and you, you looked at the 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 wealth and the power and the, the prestige of the United States of America, and you wonder how we allowed uh, you know the rise of a uh, uh, of a very aggressive uh, Marxist Leninist China, and, and how we abetted in that arise, and and I think historians are going to look back and and see us and and say. You know what, what were policymakers thinking? And we can talk about a little bit more about that uh, later. I, uh, after the uh, the 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 uh, Sudetenland uh, Munich Accords, uh, you know, he said uh, to, to the people of Great Britain. And remember, appeasement was quite popular at the time. I mean, Chamberlain came back to to acclaim. Now we look back, and and Chamberlain's a a, a dirty word, and a, an appeasement is a dirty word. But appeasement was quite popular when uh, when the Munich Accords were signed. And I was thinking, similarly with the JCPOA uh, and and the, the the deal with the devil that uh, that we made with Iran, and and I thought this applies. Uh, the, the words he he said in Parliament, uh, 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 and it was very unpopular for stating them. He said they should know, talking about the people, that there has been a gross neglect and deficiency in our defenses. They should know that we have sustained a defeat without war. The consequences of us uh, of which will travel far with us along the road. And then he, he went on to say, do, you, do not suppose this is the end. This is only the beginning of the reckoning and, and talked about, you know, the, the supreme recovery of moral health and martial vigor. Uh, I, I think some of that has occurred in the United States. But at, but at the time, uh, you know, those were the speeches that were resonating. Uh, uh, but as you go through different stages of your life or you, you know, you, you, you read my early life, you think of those those fun swashbuckling days in Cuba and India and Afghanistan and and Sudan and uh, and South Africa. Not all that was fun. It was it was it was uh, it was serious business of war. But but of, of a young adventurous Churchill, uh, you know that's an appealing time. Uh, and then I, you know as you get older and as I, as I look, uh, especially after a couple of years in these jobs, and you start thinking about uh, you know retirement or, or, or getting some sleep, uh, you know cruising around the bed on the Christina or uh, or going to Monte Carlo and. Uh, or going to the track and watching the horses, you know, which occupies that last decade, you know, that kind of looks appealing as well. So the, I think it's, you know, he just lived such a long and varied life that you, you can kind of take a, a look at different uh, different segments of his career and, and depending on where you are and the, and the circumstances of the country, you draw lessons from him. Well, it's clear that you have a very, very strong grasp of history and it really raises the question and, and you've alluded to it, I think, how do policymakers use history? Which Lessons do they select? It's often said that history uh, doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. How do you view, looking beyond Winston Churchill and his experience, um, and what what examples do you use uh, in order to to help you understand 
the very different challenges that we face today? So, so that's another great question. And, and uh, let, me, let me just give you two examples from things that happened today. And, uh, and, I, and I appreciate it. I think I'm a little late for the recording here. And I appreciate you, uh, uh, you having the courtesy of waiting for me, uh, Ambassador. Uh, this morning, we, we dealt with the Abraham Accords. And we, we had a, a really terrific announcement that Sudan, which was in a state of war with the, the state of Israel, mm-hmm. uh, entered into a peace treaty. Uh, or is entering into a peace treaty uh, with uh, with Israel and normalizing diplomatic relations. And we had the Prime Minister Hamduk of uh, Sudan and uh, Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu of Israel and the President of the United States and, and a number of us uh, were in the Oval for that call to, to formalize the uh, uh, the agreement and, and we'll get it signed in the next couple of weeks. Uh, and that's the third era. Oh, thank, thank you. It was a, a big day for uh, for the President and for, for Israel and for America as, as peace starts to break out. This is the third agreement. Uh, that we've had in, in about a month of, of peace between Arab countries and, and Israel, which you know many people thought couldn't be done, we've called the the accords the Abraham Accords, and so you know to to, to really get a grasp of of what's happening in in the Middle East, and and there's a lot, and and, it, and it's a very complex area. And I know you spend a lot of time as director of policy and planning looking at those issues, and you even think of the name of the accords, the Abraham Accords. You, you know, you, you've got to know a little something about Isaac and Ishmael. You've got a little know a little something about Jacob and Esau. You've got to know a little something more modern about Sykes Pico or the Balfour uh, Declaration. Uh, you know, you've got to have a, 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 some knowledge of what uh, UN General Assembly Resolution 181, the Partition Resolution, is, uh, and everything that's happened since then. And so, uh, it, it would be very difficult for for us to to be the mediator, for us to be the convening party that brings the uh, the parties together. Uh, to play our role if you didn't have some passing familiarity with the history. Now, that, that's a, a relatively extreme example of history that goes back to, to Genesis. Uh, uh, but, but when you're in these meetings, a, as you know, uh, with these leaders, they're making references and cultural references and religious references and, uh, uh, and, uh, and bringing up things that they might be bringing up something that's, that's 70 years old. They might be bringing, some, you know, bringing up something that's 700 years old. And, and, and so I think it, it it does. It is useful to have uh, a historical background. It doesn't mean you have to be a history major to be in uh, uh, to be in government. But you know, some of those common cultural things that, that used to be prevalent and we all tended to know growing up. Uh, you know, I think we're losing a little of that, and, and that's something that worries me down the road. This afternoon, I spent some time with the foreign ministers of, of Armenia and Azerbaijan, and again, that's a conflict rooted in history, some recent history, uh, post-Soviet history. Soviet history, but then also going back to uh, uh, you know the early days of the of the conflict uh, between Christianity and Islam and in, in, in that kind of borderlands region of the Caucasus, and and I can tell you references to, to, to each one of those stages of their of their history was brought up by both both foreign ministers during our meeting. So I think it's useful to have a, a grasp of history, uh, and, and I think a grasp of history also helps you with human nature. I mean, it's you know it would be hard to think of, of understanding. Just human nature when you're in meetings with with foreign leaders or when you're thinking about military engagement, you know, if you hadn't, you know, read the Iliad or you haven't read the Aeneid and you haven't thought about some of those uh, those, those big questions and those issues that, that drive people and have driven us for, you know, thousands of years. So uh, no one had a better understanding. And no, I don't think any world leader had a better understanding of history and, and it's multifaceted, uh, uh, not not just British history, but but continental European history, world history, you know, Asian history than Churchill did. Uh, so none of us are going to measure up to, to where, you know, the this, this standard he set, but uh, we can certainly strive for it. Well, that was a very eloquent defense of the liberal arts, actually, Mr. Ambassador, yeah. and, and having a broad, broad gauge view of things. As Churchill did, since and I've I think got, since been... I've got no, yeah, I've got no STEM background, so it's, I, I can only say, <laughs> you know, it's it's like drilling, you know, moving moving to the right for a jump shot. If that's the only shot you got, you got to go with it. Well, I think that it helped inform his leadership abilities, and as you know, the uh, the National Churchill Library and Center, George Washington, has just recently been renamed to the National Churchill Leadership Center. And maybe you can you can share with us a little bit your thoughts on leadership and whether and, and how it can be taught to a, to a new generation. Oh, that, that, that's I, I think it was a great move to, to change the name of the center. And, and I think it's something Churchill would have appreciated and, and, and certainly approved of. And look, 
there, there are these different thoughts, and as we become more modern and, and more progressive and uh, and more scientific, uh, I think the idea of studying leadership, of studying great men and great women, uh, a, a, has faded a little bit in popularity, and uh, uh, in some cases is is, is even derided. Uh, and, and there's a focus on, uh, you know, geography, whether it's Mackinder or, or uh, uh, Mahan or or you know more recently Kaplan or you know, the, 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 the idea that geography is destiny. And then you've got others who it's, it's all about demography is destiny, uh, the population size or ethnicities or, or the or movements of people. And, and that explains, you know, all of history. And then and, and you've got the, the idea that uh, societal uh, uh, forces and changes uh, uh, make all the difference. And, and look, all of those things are important in studying history. But if you think about, you know, one of the things that I you know, try and do is if I go out and exercise in the morning or Take walks. It's hard to, to, to have as much time to read in this job as, as I'd like, but I'm trying to listen to Audible and you know listen to Andrew Roberts' uh, Napoleon uh, biography, which is really a magnificent book. Now I just finished Cherno's uh, Grant biography. But if you just go back in history, you, you know you, you can pick a hundred of these lists. But if you you know if you thought sort of Alexander and and, uh, and 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 Scipio Africanus and Caesar and you know you know jumped ahead uh, you know to more modern times to to Washington, Napoleon, Lincoln, Grant, uh, Churchill, Reagan, Thatcher, Dr. King. Uh, where would we be? You know, you go a little further, Elizabeth I. Where would we be as a nation, or as uh, as a West, or as people, if you didn't have those those great leaders? And so, you know, I, I'm kind of at all of the above. I think certainly demography and geography and 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 societal uh, forces. Uh, all play a huge role in shaping us and in shaping our history, but I also think that there's there's a place for great men and great women and for leaders, and uh, so so I think studying and, and and when you look at all of them, uh, and you look at what happened in 1940, uh, there there's there's certainly a case to be made. I, you know, I, I could make the case. You could you could you know make the case in a in a in a, in a trial uh, measure or back practicing, practicing law that. You know, Churchill could be, you know, is arguably the great, greatest or, 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 you know, top three or four in, in, you know, relatively modern history, the past couple of millennia. Uh, and, and so to have a, a, a center devoted to the study of his leadership attributes and his qualities and the things that he did. I mean, you just you think of some of them. I mean, so, someone like my current boss, you know, he didn't sleep very often. You know, he'd, he'd be up till two or three or four in the morning. And, uh, you know, unless Smuts was there to call the call the party off early and let the staff officers go go get some some sleep before they had to go out to work in the morning. Now he took his naps and he slept in a little later in the morning, but you know, you know, he he, he had a, a tremendous amount of vigor and he used all the as much time of the day as he could. Uh you know, I, I loved his actions this day. Uh mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. clips uh, paper that he clip onto uh to his bundles and uh, and and we call that, you know, here Trump time with the president. We've got a, a very energetic president who wants to get things done immediately and doesn't doesn't kind of look at the, the world the way that you know some of the uh, you know President Bush who we worked for or others that we've worked for in the past. You know he's 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 anxious and, and impatient and wants to get things done in, in a way that uh, that Churchill wanted to. Uh, you know I think the one of the things that uh, uh, Sir Winston did was the way that he he wrote and communicated. Everyone knew what his views were, either, whether it was through his memos and you know he, you know he had a he had more secretaries than I've got or. <laughs> or, uh, or probably even the president has, and 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 rotate them through them all day with his dictation. But no one, no one was confused about what his policies were and what he wanted done. And uh, uh, he did the same thing with his writings, and he did the same thing with his speeches. And so, uh, and he inspired people with his speeches. It wasn't just here's the plan or here's the the policy. Uh, he inspired people. I mean, Ronald Reagan did that. I think of you know one of the great speeches, the Point to Hook speech, which was you know, Churchill esque and. Uh, in nature, uh, the, the ability to, to to inspire your followers, and so so there are just so many lessons that you can take from uh, Churchill's life that uh, can be taught at the at the center and at the leadership center. I think it's a it's a great. Uh, I think George Washington uh, University is is lucky to have the center there, and it's a it's a great asset for the university for sure. Well, thank you, thank you for that. One of the the more memorable phrases that Churchill coined was a special relationship. Uh, to describe the Anglo-American alliance uh, during the Second World War. And over the years, I think it's fair to say that the special relationship has sort of waxed and waned. Um, I believe that it still very much exists, but I'm, I'm very interested in hearing your thoughts. Uh, what form does it now take? Is it as strong as ever? Is it changing? 
Um, and what do you think the future of the special relationship holds for us? So, look, I, I think it's a critical relationship uh, uh, for both us and, and for the UK. Uh, you know, usually my first call, uh, if there's a, a crisis or a major issue, uh, would be to my counterpart, Mark Sedwell. And uh, Mark, I think, is going to go off to, uh, I'm sure they'll go off to the House of Lords and be Lord Sedwell here soon. But uh, now you know, I'll call Dom, Ra uh, you know, Foreign Secretary Rab. Uh, that, that's usually the first call we make when we've got a major policy issue or there's something something breaking is we'll check in with with the UK and we'll we'll get their view of how things are going and, and where we can we'll we'll approach things jointly. Uh, I think with the UK leaving the EU, I think uh, we're going to end up with a free trade agreement with the UK. I think that's going to further cement the special relationship. Uh, you know, it, it's and, and I would expand it beyond just the UK US relationship really to, to what we call the Five Eyes relationship, which mm -hmm. focuses on intelligence sharing agreement, but. When you when you factor in the the, the Anglosphere, where you, the UK, the US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, it's an incredibly powerful uh, group of countries that that you know increases our our ability to to protect our way of life. Uh, it, it increases our, our overall population. It increases our uh, our defense capabilities. It increases our intelligence capabilities. It increases our economic capabilities. When we're confronting a, a rising China, we're, we're conf confronting Russia. That doesn't mean that we don't have other great allies, but but there is a special relationship and a, and a kinship that we have with the UK. You know, I think of post World War II. Maybe the best example is my friend John Lehman, and I. I know you know Secretary Lehman as well. Mm -hmm. In 1982, uh, we didn't learn this for for many years later. I think he didn't really he didn't uh, let folks know until '98. Uh, uh, he and Cap Weinberger had gotten together and decided that. If the UK and the Falklands War lost Hermé or, or Invincible, that we would supply uh, the USS Iwo Jima, uh, which was was uh, uh, Harrier uh, capable uh, to the to the UK, and we were actually had had British liaison officers, and uh, we would have leased the the ship to the UK immediately and and gotten it down to the Falklands to replace one of the carriers that had fallen. People don't realize that's the depth of the relationship, and although it was kept very quiet at the time. I think President Reagan, as as uh, Lehman recounts, uh, told him when he explained the plan, "Give Maggie whatever she needs," and I think there's I think there's a real strong element that remain that remains today. I, I was just out on the Queen Elizabeth last year, uh, the aircraft carrier, when she made a a visit to the U.S. She deployed uh, two weeks ago for for uh, a naval exercise, and of the Harry, or, me, of the F-35 uh, uh, Bs, there were ten U.S. Marine Corps uh, F-35 Bs. And, and five uh, RAF uh, F-35Bs. So we had U.S. air power on a British carrier. Uh, one of the escort ships, there were a number of them, one of them was the USS Sullivan's, a destroyer, uh, escorting the, the new uh, U.K. strike group. So that interoperability and that, that relationship and, and, and much of the special relationship you know, goes back to the, uh, the naval alliance between the countries that's, that's, that's you know, well predates the Second World War. I, I think that continues. And so I, I think it's, you know, I think it's the relationship between us and the UK is strong. We're going to have differences as, as we do, but we're we're mature countries and we can handle those differences, whether they're trade differences or differences on a on a specific policy. We can handle those in a in a mature fashion, and and, and just because we disagree on one issue doesn't undermine the the overall strength of the alliance. And I think you'd agree the foundation of that special relationship is really a set of shared values that go back centuries. Yeah. And you recently wrote an article, I think just a few days ago, that appeared in Foreign Affairs about China being a threat to those values. And the question really relates to Churchill, who presciently warned about the twin evils of fascism and communism and the threats that they pose to Western civilization. So I think I know the answer, but as you survey the global landscape, what threats do you see out there that might pose those same that same challenge for American democracy or Western Western values writ large. Well, that, that's a question I'm asked uh, a fair a fair amount. Uh, I think just because of the job, and I think the the answer is twofold. I think the the the, the generational threat that we face, and uh, thanks for plugging the foreign affairs piece. It's out in this this month's foreign affairs, so it, uh, you can get it online. Uh, it, it certainly is China. I mean, we, we face a very, very serious threat from the, the Communist Party of China and the, the People's Republic. Uh, it, it's a threat that we should have known earlier, we should have recognized earlier, but, but for 40 years, we've all had this consensus that as China became richer, as China became uh, 
uh, more industrial, as, as China became uh, uh, more modern, they would become more like us. And so we turned a blind eye to intellectual property theft. We turned a blind eye to human rights abuses, whether it was Tiananmen Square, or Tibet, or bullying of, of Taiwan, now the, uh, uh, basically the annexation of, of Hong Kong, or at least the, the ending of the uh, Sino-British Declaration of 1984 and, and ending the democratic experiment in Hong Kong. Uh, we're seeing a, a very nasty little conflict that China started on the line of actual control in the Himalayas between China and uh, India. You've got the, the assertiveness in the South China Sea where China's basically a annexed a huge swath of the Western Pacific uh, with, with no legal basis whatsoever. We've turned a blind eye to all this because we thought, ah, oh, they're going to become more democratic. And, and we did that because we didn't read and we didn't listen to what the Chinese were saying. And the Chinese all, of along, all along have been a Marxist-Leninist country. Uh, they're the heirs to Stalin. If you go into the PLA Army Museum, there's a big statue of Stalin as you walk in. Uh, Xi Jinping, uh, I, I, I gave a speech about this. It was, it was similar to the Foreign Affairs article. And the Chinese didn't really know how to respond to it for many months. They, they, were, they hammered Secretary Pompeo's speech. They hammered my deputy, Matt Pottinger's speech. Uh, they hammered Bill Barr's speech, Attorney General Barr's speech. They didn't know what to say about mine because I said, hey, these are Marxist-Leninists and here's what they believe and they want to change our, our way of life. And, uh, and, and the problem is that that's what they do believe. And so if you criticized it, you might get in trouble for criticizing the uh, party orthodoxy. But they knew it, it was a bad look uh, for, for, that, for that, that message to get out overseas. Uh, so look, we, we've got to stand up to that threat. The, the more immediate threat that we have on a day-to-day -day basis comes from the uh, Islamic Republic of, of Iran. Uh, which is the, the flip side of the coin of ISIS, uh, and it's just in a state form and an a, 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 extreme Shia form. Uh, Iran is propagating terror all over the world, but specifically in the Middle East with, Ham with a relationship with Hamas, Hezbollah, the Assad regime, uh, the Houthis, uh, the, the Khatib Hezbollah, and the other paramilitary groups in, in Iraq. Uh, it, it's a real challenge. Uh, they're they're building uh, advanced weapons. The arms embargo just ended, and they're going to be attempting to buy even more advanced weapons. They're building ballistic missiles that could eventually reach the United States. Uh, they're spinning their centrifuges. Uh, so we've got a real real problem with Iran. I think we're dealing with it by uh, the maximum pressure campaign, and I think they're under tremendous economic pressure. That may drive them to the table. But that's a, that's a short-term threat that if the, if the mullahs miscalculate and decide to attack a U.S. ship in the Strait of Hormuz or... Uh, you know, attack U.S. forces or allies uh, to 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 break the uh, what they see the stranglehold on their economy. Uh, that that's the sort of the sort of thing that could end up with a a more short term uh, conflagration. So so those are the two things that uh, on on the bigger threat scale that we look at uh, almost every day. So I'm wondering if I can just uh, follow up and, and sort of twin those two together. Uh, and so how concerned are you that uh, the Chinese will actually continue to support the Islamic Republic of Iran in ways that we think will be detrimental to our security and to the security of our friends in the region and elsewhere? Well, look, it's a concern. They're trying to put together a, uh, a longer-term deal for the a long-term petroleum purchase uh, contract, so to speak. Uh, you know, there's they're support, but, but the, look, the, the, the Iranians are pretty nationalistic. Uh, the Chinese are pretty nationalistic. They're both used to getting their way. Uh, I think the two of them negotiating together would be something to uh, to watch. Uh, I think there's also a geopolitical problem for the the Chinese, and it's something that we've found, uh, having been in the Middle East for many many years. Uh, you know, the, the Chinese biggest supplier of of oil and gas is the UAE. Uh, the UAE is not uh, a big fan of the uh, Islamic Republic of Iran, so uh, China is going to have to learn how to navigate. They can't just come in and and uh, take all sides in the Middle East the way that they they do in, in some other regions. And, and so they're going to have to start thinking about, do, you know, how do we pick our allies? How do we pick our trading partners? And, and I, you know, I think, I think uh, China is going to have a, a tougher time than they think they may navigate in the Middle East, just as we found it hasn't been a, uh, a picnic over the past, uh, you know, since the end of the Second World War. So I I'm, I'm want to change gears for a second and get back to, uh, to Winston Churchill and his political career, uh, during the course of which he made many powerful enemies. And yet, uh, quite remarkably to somebody who's reading uh, about it today, he was also very generous in separating his personal opponents, uh, his professional opponents from his personal friendships. He had ongoing social relationships with many of the people who he argued with and uh, 
in Parliament every day. And so today, looking back on that, that seems like a bygone era. Uh, is it possible to, to take some of the vitriol, some of the, the demonization out of politics and still at least maintain personal cordial relationships with people who politically feel differently than you do? Yeah, I, I think we need to. We're in a, uh, this is the U.S., but I, I think there's some some polarization in the U.K. as well. But but especially here in the U.S. and in Washington, we're in a very polarized time. And I, and I j just compared in, in my lifetime, when it's not not uh, career is not a long span. But I came back to Washington as a, as an 18 year old intern the first time I came to work here uh, to work for the RNC during President Reagan's reelection. And the first call I got at the RNC was from a young Democrat congressman who represented us out in California, and I. I'd known him and you know knew his family and uh, and called up and said, hey, do you, you know, are you you getting a place to to eat dinner? Do they have a decent internship program there? And I ended up every Friday night, you know, meeting up with his interns and uh, his wife was a, a, a state court judge and uh, and hanging out. It, it was it was very uh, normal. People had relationships across the aisle. Uh, congressmen and senators got along with each other. Uh, I remember the same congressman called and said, hey, if you don't want to work for a Democrat, I'll call my friend uh, Olympia Snow, who used to be a congresswoman from uh, from Maine, and uh, said, yeah, you can go to work for her next summer if you'd like to. There, there was just a different uh, a, a different environment, a different sense in Washington, and uh, I, I think there was more socializing across the aisle than there is now. Uh, I think social media has had a, a very detrimental effect on how we communicate with each other. It's, uh, it's much more vitriolic. Uh, but I've also had some success here. I think of my, my prior job before I, I uh, took this position, I was the president's uh, special envoy for hostage affairs. And when there's American hostage ab abroad, you don't care, you know, what party they are, what race or religion they are over there. It's just an American that we need to get home. And, and I had some very good relationships working with Democrat senators and, and de Democrat members of Congress who are trying to get people home. Gene Shaheen worked very hard, uh, the senator from the Democrat from uh, New Hampshire worked very hard to get Pastor Andrew Brunson home from uh, from Turkey. Uh, she also worked with me on a, on a hostage, uh, Amir Fakuri, who was a wrongful detainee who was in Lebanon. And so we developed some great relationships across the uh, the aisle with our Democrat friends. I had uh, <laughs> the, the misfortune or maybe the, the, the good fortune, I got a little immunity from of having COVID this summer. and. I, I mm. won't. Uh, I, I won't embarrass the person, but uh, you know, one of the most senior Democrats in the in the country uh, was was one of the first people to call to see how I was doing to make make sure I was all right. And I was I was, you know, very very touched by that. It was a you know very humane, uh, uh, nice thing to do. And then you know I'm sure, you know, the person went out and gave me a hard time for uh, not wearing a mask or something later, <laughs> later on a Sunday show. But uh, so so I look. I think the 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 the. Uh, I, I think there's a desire for, for people to, to have a little more civility in politics on both sides of the aisle, and I think that's something that we need to get back to. And I was encouraged by the debate last night between the president and the vice president. I thought it was a, uh, you know, quite a, uh, a professional performance by, uh, uh, by, by both, both men. And, uh, and, and I, you know, I, I think Churchill's a good example that uh, we, can, we can have disagreements without being disagreeable, and we can, uh, we can realize that we're, we're, we're uh, you know, uh, Britons or Americans, uh, uh, even though we have our, uh, different political parties, and and and, uh, and, and, and enjoy our com you know the camaraderie ship that we, our com comradeship that we have as as fellow citizens or fellow subjects. And um, well, thank you. That's that's very encouraging, actually. And I want to touch on your your reference to social media because it seems as if it so often just inflames public opinion. People are outraged immediately, and then they understand belatedly. And so, uh, you know, maybe you could share with us, what do you try to do? What do you think Churchill could possibly have done in this environment to try to, uh, to, try to educate, to try to explain, to try to have people be a little bit more reasonable and understanding rather than just judging immediately? Well, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I think he would have been a genius at Twitter. Uh, I would have <laughs> loved to have seen the uh, WSC on Twitter because he would have, he would have worked for days and days and days to come up with that perfect 180 character spontaneous uh, uh, tweet that went out just at the right time. Uh, he would have had a, a number of those lined up and ready to go that he'd worked on and, and been prepared for. So I think he would have been a he would have been terrific on Twitter. Uh, look, one of the things he did though, and I, I think we need to, you know, I, I've tried to do this some is is a use Twitter. I, I don't have a Facebook account, but we have a, a White House NSC Twitter account. 
uh, try to use that to be informative about what we're doing and, and what's happening without, uh, uh, you know, and I, I like, I, it's easier for me because I have a, a non-political job uh, and, uh, uh, you know, we're a Hatch Act, uh, we're, we're covered by the Hatch Act and I'm a further restricted employee because of my national security duties. And so, you know, we try not to, to be overtly political. I mean, obviously we're going to talk about the present successes and, and some may view that as being political, but we try and have a very informative Twitter feed and, you know, I think that's one way to address it. The other thing that we've done is I've tried to write one or two op-eds a month. Uh, again, six to 800 words isn't enough to, to fully flesh out and explain uh, a policy, even if one, uh, especially if it's in a, a complex area. But it, it does give you more uh, space to explain to the American people, to explain to the government, you know, the, the folks that, that are implementing the president's policies, uh, uh, how the president sees a particular issue. And so I think we've had 18, 19, 20 op-eds. Uh, we had the foreign affairs uh, piece that you mentioned earlier. Uh, I probably give you know one or two speeches a week. I use it to think tanks, but I try and get out to universities and and even shipyards and uh, uh, places around the, the country that that, that should or, or, or are interested in hearing about the president's national security policies. And, and so I think we've, I've probably given 50 or 60 speeches over the past year. And, and I think that's a, a, another way to get the message out that uh, is a little more textured than you just get in 180 characters on Twitter. I think it's now 240, whatever the, the new number is uh, for Twitter. So, Mr. Ambassador, thank you for that. Um, I'm sure uh, back when you had uh, more time on your hands that you you probably visited the war rooms in London. Yeah. And in one of those rooms, um, you can actually uh, see the, the room where Churchill met with his senior military advisors. And if you look very closely, you can notice the chair in which Churchill sat has a well-worn groove on the left arm uh, that was formed by Churchill banging his hand on the chair in the wedding ring, actually making an indentation uh, in the chair itself. And I think it just gives one sort of small, visible, tangible indication of the enormous pressure that he was under as a leader at that particular moment in time. And I'm sure it's true for you and your, your current position. How do you manage, how do you manage the stress and the pressure of leadership uh, at a time of enormous uh, moment, of enormous responsibility? Yeah, so, so fortunately we're not, uh, we're not in a world war, which uh, Sir Winston was at the time that he, he grooved that chair. And, and I, I, I love the, uh, the cabinet war rooms. It's, uh, I, I remember I, I, every time I go to the UK, I try and, and visit. It's a little tougher now because you've got the detail and a schedule and it's, it's hard just to spontaneously break away. But I remember taking one trip where I had, a, I think, a five-hour layover at, at Heathrow and I had just enough time to uh, get in the cab and get to the cabinet war rooms go through them, get in the cab, get back and, uh, and board my, my connecting flight. And, and, it, and it's an amazing place. And it gives you a real feel for, uh, for what he was going through uh, during those years. Uh, like you, you just try and do your best. You, uh, you know, one thing I, I, I try and uh, exercise in the morning uh, if I can. I try and spend as much time uh, with my wife and, uh, and when they're in town, my daughters and, and, and family. I try and spend some time reading uh, things that may not be you know, directly related to the the briefs that you're, you're given every day, the stacks of paper you're given every day. Uh, and, and I think that's how you can you can manage the, the stress. The other thing is to, is to try and just have some magnanimity in, in your relationships with other people uh, uh, that you're working around. I mean, everybody's got, you know, everyone you're working with sitting around, we're in the Situation Room here, and what we call the, the John F. Kennedy Conference Room in the Situation Room. And, and I, if I'm sitting here, I'll have Mike Pompeo and, and Mark Esper and, and Steve Mnuchin and and Wilbur Ross and, and the Chief of Staff Meadows and Pat Cipollone of the White House Council and, and, and others, uh, uh, Attorney General Barr sitting around this table. Every one of them is under immense pressure and, and has their has equities from their uh, their department or agency that they're uh, protecting and, and, and everyone wants to get to the right decision. And I think if you, you know, one way to, to, to lessen the stress is if you, if you really come into these uh, meetings and your interactions with, with your colleagues, uh, with, with a true belief that they're acting in good faith and uh, they're not acting to undermine you or the president or a policy or that sort of thing, but we're trying to get to the right uh, result. But, but folks have different points of views and different interests and, 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 and maybe validly so, may, maybe better than yours. If you can have that sort of attitude as you, as you deal with your, your colleagues and try and build consensus and try and get the president the best advice and the best options you can, uh, I think that relieves a little bit of the stress as well. So it's not a, it's not quite the infighting that you might read about if you if you just read political or Axios or, 
for some of the stories. We've, you know, we've got a pretty good, pretty good team and pretty good relations here, and I think that's something that helps re- reduce the, the stress of the job as well as by sharing it uh, among colleagues who are, who are highly capable. Gina Haspel is, a, is another one who'd fall into that category. So, Mr. Ambassador, thank you so much for sharing some of your valuable time with the International Churchill Society, and thank you very much for your service. Well, th- thanks. I read the newsletter as soon as it comes out every every month, and uh, I wish we could be there in person. With the uh, with with COVID, it's a uh, it's a little difficult to do these things recorded by Zoom. But uh, hopefully, I'll get a chance to to meet with you in person in the not too distant future. And and uh, Mitchell, thank you for all your past service to the country and uh, and for your friendship. So I pr- appreciate the chance to be with you today. Great. Thanks very much. Welcome back, everyone. What a fascinating conversation, especially with Ambassador O'Brien detailing the important peace deal that he helped negotiate between Sudan and Israel just a few days ago. I'd like to thank on behalf of the entire society, uh, Ambassador O'Brien and Ambassador Reese for participating in our conference. Remember, all of the conference sessions are being recorded and will be available to watch on demand in the future. Furthermore, if you're having audio troubles, we, what we suggest is that you try a different web browser, whether that be uh, Chrome or Firefox or Safari. Um, so please do, please do try to tr- troubleshoot audio problems in that way. So I'm pleased to be joined now by Geneva Henry, who is the Dean of Libraries and Academic Innovation at George Washington. Good morning, Geneva. Good morning, Justin. How are you doing? Very good, very good. So as, as of course you know, um, the National Churchill Library and Center was renamed to the National Churchill Leadership Center. Uh, and as the dean of that oversees the center in, in Gelman Library, right in the heart of George Washington's campus, um, can you tell us what the, you know, what the impetus of the, the name change was? I know you are one of the great proponents of, of this name change. Yeah, thanks. Um, So what became apparent once we uh, launched the, uh, you know, the center was that uh, there were a few things happening. I mean, we were all really excited about it. Um, But what I started seeing was people coming in saying, where's the library, the Churchill Library? And then, um, you know, we would take them into the space and there was this level of, um, you know, disappointment. They look crestfallen. And then we explained, you know, this really is about um, you know, being able to have a conversation about Churchill, being able to, you know, discuss the many facets um, of him as a world leader, because he's a model. The reason the NCLC fits so well at GW is there, there is a real focus on leadership um, with our students and building that, especially at an international level. So um, all of that fit really well. Um, but this constant confusion and people would ask, well, where are all the books? It's like, well, this isn't his library. I mean, that's in Cambridge. <laughs> and then, you know, the, it, just sort of the expectations. And once people were level set, th- then it was fine. Um, but it, it happened so many times that it, it just seemed uh, like we probably should do something about it. So um, I had a conversation with Lawrence about it. And, um, you know, we, we talked about it, said, and a few people had suggested well, she really should be the leadership center. Um, once I would explain what we were doing and um, the kinds of people we were bringing in and the conversations we had. Um, so um, I think Lawrence agreed. He's like, yeah, this would be great. Um, and it also opens sure. the door, I think, to um, another uh, set of um, you know people Um, who might not be interested in the Churchill Library, but once it's the leadership center, um, that suddenly sparks a a lot of interest from um, others who not necessarily thinking specifically of Churchill, but understanding that, you know, this is the the place um, where interesting conversations are going to happen. This is where we can um, really focus on leadership issues. Yeah, I, I think that's a really great point in, in terms of broadening the base. And I, I think of the, the uh, you know, numerous different centers and, and departments at George Washington um, that we that we will certainly liaise with and, and, and engage with because, you know, by by having this name as leadership, we can really broaden the base and, and we can educate 
um, you know, some people, a, a large swath of people who probably wouldn't come into the center, like, you know, like you said, but now that they are uh, coming to more events and with different speakers and with different departments, we can really get in front of them and, and, and be able to discuss the story of Churchill, uh, both, both uh, the success and of course the adversity and, and that he faced. Um, so it's very exciting. Um, you know, I was thinking, how can we, you know, in, in partnership, you and I together in partnership, um, what opportunities arise from, from your point of view for on-campus collaboration? Um, you know, of course, there is the, the Create Lab, which is new right, right next door to the, to the uh, center, you know, thinking of digital humanities. What are one or two things that, that you see now as, as some opportunities for collaboration that exist? Yeah, that's a great question. So there are, you know, as you mentioned, there are, are many centers around GW. Certainly the um, El Elliott School of International mm -hmm. Studies is um, you know, a flagship of George Washington University. And we've had a good relationship with them. Um, but this gives us an opportunity for um, even more uh, engagement with them, uh, certainly as we uh, co can co-host programs together, um, you know, in working with them before the NCLC came along, um, we worked with um, the U.S. Institute of Peace, which is just down the road from GW, to forge a relationship there um, between um, the library, the Elliott School, and USIP. So I think, you know, there's another avenue that's a, a world full of leaders that uh, we can um, bring into um, the NCLC as uh, you you know, a place to have discussions um, about the work they do. Uh, members of the State Department, uh, a lot of them are um, part-time teachers at GW in the Elliott School, so uh, certainly building that. Um, also, our, our School of Engineering uh, is growing. Uh, certainly that tie-in with the Create Digital Lab that's right outside of the NCLC um, brings opportunities to talk about uh, technology. As we all know, technology was a big thing with Churchill. He, he yeah. was you know, all for that. And I think a lot of people don't understand that. Um, they just don't uh, think of Churchill as a, a technology guy, of but he would, I think if he were here, he would just be so excited and all over this. So to bring in those many facets that people don't think about um, and uh, have the discussions around that and take um, what we're doing in new directions. Yeah, and, and you know, of course, one of the, not one of the, the most important constituent base at George Washington is of course the student and the student body. Um, you know what I was thinking of, of how can we further engage with these students who are ambitious, who are involved, um, you know, uh, to, to the brim with, with all of their activities. Um, you know, I was thinking, you know, how for the center itself, now that we're leadership center, by creating a, a student advisory board, we can really bring them into the fold and into the conversation and really allow them to lead some programming, lead some, some, some engagement and allow them to take some ownership of what this center is and their also, also their own understanding of Churchill. So we can, we can guide these students and, and be a resource for them. Um, you know, from your mind, what for students themselves, how, how do you think this name change will, um, will resonate with them? And you kind of touch on it, of course, with being in the nation's capital, but um, any, any other ways that you think that the students will be uh, excited by this name change? Yeah, that's a really great point, um, Justin. I think uh, they will be excited about it because they see themselves as leaders. Um, as you're aware, GW is one of the most politically active campuses in the U.S., and it's a big reason students come to GW. You know, many do aspire to uh, public service leadership mm -hmm. positions. So I, I think having that name, leadership associated with it, um, will be uh, really a magnet um, for them and help to really engage them in the issues they care about because they want to talk about these issues on all sides. They want to explore explore them. So I think they will bring in um, fresh ideas uh, mm -hmm. and they don't all agree with each other. Uh, if, you know, despite what some people may think, there is no single student mindset at GW. Mm -hmm. So, um, and they welcome 
um, debate. Um, you know, they welcome discussion. They welcome exploring um, anything having to do with leadership. Uh, and they realize to um, be at the international level on the international stage, um, your perspectives need to be broad. You cannot mm -hmm. be a narrow-minded um, person. So I think they uh, will bring that in. And I think we will have an opportunity to also um, really open up uh, possibilities for them as they do think about leadership. Yeah, certainly. And and if uh, I will also say, as you know, and, and may, uh, maybe some of the people um, watching now don't know, but um, we have already, you know, the NCLC in its former iteration, of course, was very successful in bringing in um, uh, leaders and speakers. Um, you know, President Musharraf from Pakistan comes to mind, of course. And so it has, of course, the, um, we have that, that space to, to uh, that attracts those who are in the, who are in the capital. Um, and thinking of what, um, you know, we were just talking about programming between, between departments. As you know, the Graduate School of Political Management, we are sponsoring ICS and the National Church of Leadership Center are sponsoring a, a, a residency program in London, um, which, which will be a, a, in conjunction to their, their rotating res residency program um, so I, I personally am excited to see that to see that um, come to fruition. Of course, you know, with COVID, we, we won't be able to travel. Um, but I wanted to, you know, with only one one or two minutes left, I wanted to ask you what are your uh, what are your personal, um, you know, what are you personally looking forward to when we come back to campus and 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 uh, hopefully this coming fall uh, of 2021 and 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 activating this space. Yeah, I'm, I am very excited. Um, I think, you know, uh, we've all been dealt a big blow, but um, it's also a level set. So uh, I think we'd be remiss in not leveraging what we're learning um, by working in this kind of environment and being able to um, host events and being able to you know, bring these things to, to light. So I think um, there's an opportunity when we get back, especially with the new um, name to really focus on leadership. What does it mean, you know, across the world and do it in ways that leverage um, advanced technologies and take yes. innovative approaches um, to how we're able to uh, engage everybody worldwide, engage worldwide leaders in new ways that um, don't seem degraded at all, but the technology really lets us um, leverage uh, the uh, expertise that we can tap into. Yeah, yeah, and I I would like to reiterate that point. Um, and and for my last my last moment here, but um, you're you're so right. I loved that you talked about Churchill's affinity for technology. He was always looking for both on his personal life and then of course when he was uh, leaving the country, how technology can change. Of course, the tide of the war, how it can move society forward, and I really see especially with being right next door to the Create Digital Lab, how can we engage with students with the technology that they use and, and tell Churchill's story with their technology and, and, and meet them on their terms? Because I think that's how they learn these days, right? You know, they learn through of digital and they learn through, you know, their iPhones, their iPads. So let's lean into that and really bring them into the fold. So I, I greatly look forward to partnering you, with you and, and, of course, Robin on that. Um, and I wanted to thank you for, for taking time out this morning to, to uh, talk about this exciting news with us. Well, thank you, Justin. It's been great to have this opportunity and um, I, I wish you all the best of luck. Uh, enjoy your conference. Uh, and I do look forward to a really a new beginning for all of us. Yes, certainly. Well, thank you, Geneva. Um, so we're about to head into a, a 15 minute break, but before we do so, I would like to preview uh, the videos that attendees will be seeing during this intermission. The International Church of Society is a major sponsor of a collaboration between publishing company Bloomsbury and the Churchill Archives Center at Churchill College, Cambridge. This partnership has recently digitized the entire Churchill Archives collection, over 800,000 documents from Sir Winston's personal archive, and has made it accessible online via subscription. However, the most important part of this is that the collection is free for any school across the globe. This collaboration was made possible by the generosity of ICS Chairman Lawrence Geller, uh, who is a very generous man, uh, as we all know. So thank you very much, Lawrence, for making this possible. 
Um, and so we are now going to show some of these videos in the break about this initiative. To learn more, you can go to www.churchillarchiveforschools.com. Again, that is www.churchillarchiveforschools.com. But my last uh, piece here before I do sign off and we go into the break is another quiz question for you. And this time, as Alan stated at the top of the program, this has a prize attached to it. So I will read the question um, and, and, and I'll read the question twice and please email your answers to the conference email address, which is 2020 at winstonchurchill.org. One entrant who emails us with the correct answer will be given a signed limited edition print of a work by Churchill's granddaughter and artist Edwina Sands. It's titled St. Paul's Cathedral, and it was made exclusively for our partner organization, America's National Churchill Museum at Westminster College, in honor of the 80th anniversary of the Blitz. We will be hearing from, from uh, the Church, National Churchill Museum a little later today. The award recipient will be announced at 12.30 p.m. Eastern time at the end of the conference. So here is the question. How many times did Churchill visit the United States? Was it A? 23, B, 10, C, 4, or D, 16. I'll read this once more. How many times did Churchill visit the United States? A, 23, B, 10, C, 4, or D, 16. Good luck and thanks so much for joining us and please enjoy the wonderful videos you see at the break.
So here are five reasons why you should register your school for the Churchill Archive and make use of the Churchill Archive for Schools.com resources. 1. You'll build students' confidence in using primary sources, an important historical skill that appears on school curricula worldwide. Textbooks tend to digest the material for students, they regurgitate it in the right order, sometimes they, there's a narrative voice in the textbook, they'll have a teacher possibly as well talking to them about this, but with the archive, quite often the student is alone with the source and the screen, and they have to really find their feet with it. You're, you're, you're there, you know what I mean? You can imagine you're in his head sort of and looking at what he personally thought about what was going on at that time. The Churchill Archives, it shows you all the different intricate ways that history works. You see the letters sent from Churchill to Clement Attlee about how he was trying to convince him to do certain things. You see the side you don't usually see as we experience it in real life. You see everything that's happening behind the scenes. Two, you'll be encouraging them to engage with historical events and make connections to the present day. Being able to contextualise events and understand historical concepts like change, continuity, cause and consequence will make students better historians. Well, I think mainly people talk about the differences um, between the past and where we are now. But I think what's more interesting is looking at the similarities of understanding that we are all connected somehow through our own universal history. What I enjoy about studying history is that um, that I can go back in like time and see all the amazing people um, and what they've done and how they've helped the world to become what it is like today. Three, the investigations will help students understand key topics in modern international history and the wide range of investigations means there's something to suit everyone. My group studied, did nuclear weapons make the world safer between 1945 and 1951, which then allowed us to look through the archives and the sources that we were given to help us answer the question. I found interesting how um, the suffragettes used violence instead of peace to be peaceful and law abiding. Four, the resources are very flexible, so you can use them in whatever way suits your teaching, with the whole class, for group work or as homework assignments. And um, what's great about the Churchill uh, Archive as well is you have a simplified resource and then you have a, a more detailed resource. So also that differentiates for children and, and, and being a secondary school teacher that's very important because all children are different types of learners. It's important that our students can have access to that. Obviously you can't travel from all over the country to the archives, so to have them arriving in your school computer room is a real asset to history teachers. Five. And last, but by no means least, the activities will help students develop the research skills that are vital for success in higher education. It's never too early to start. This has helped me develop skills like analysing language, being able to pick out the information that is just necessary, also being able to like, skim read and just um, pick out the quotes that are the best for your argument or whatever you're learning about. You know, seeing the Year 8 students today having a go at that and evaluating sources in a really uh, mature way like a historian does, it's going to go a long way, I think, for their development as young historians, definitely. So please join the 2,000 schools who've already registered for the Churchill Archive and make the most of this fantastic resource by visiting churchillarchiveforschools.com. I was at university only three, four years ago myself, and I remember the real struggle of you know, writing two dissertations at once and having to go into a massive old book of primary sources and thinking, you know, what on earth am I going to use here and how can, you know, what is useful, what isn't? And I think giving them that opportunity now to start to think about what sources are useful, why, what are their limitations, um, it's great practice. What I like about studying history is looking back on what has happened in this world and mate, and I want to see how that reflects on um, today life. I like studying history because it tells us about events in the past which, which may have influenced events that are happening now. It enables them to become critical adults and in an era of fake news then we need to go back to the, the sources, the primary sources and so the, the archives here are real, the, mother, the mothership of truth like a focal length of a camera, you can only look at certain things, but when you broaden it up, you can see this whole bigger picture. 
In history, I enjoyed that it gives us the opportunity to like widen our knowledge from diff from different aspects of our past. Because usually nowadays everyone's on their phones and all that, so we don't really get to discover about our past and how it comes to bring us to how we live now. Seeing real documents and understanding and exploring real documents, so from letters to um, acts, um, conversations, things that you would never ever get in a textbook, because remember a textbook is someone's an opinion, it's an interpretation of history. I found that I, when I was looking at the documents in the original reports, I found that like really interesting and amazing, like because like, it made me love history more and like got me a bit interest in the topic and if like I would like to carry that on in GCSEs. What the archive allows us to do is actually take history from a textbook and make it real life. Dear fellow Churchillians, I was kindly asked by our mutual friend Ellen Packwood to give you a very brief overview of the main regular events of the Churchill Society of Portugal. And I'm delighted to, to do that right now. Uh, we have mainly two, actually, we have mainly two events per year, and they both are called the Winston Churchill Memorial Lecture and Dinner. One takes place at the end of the academic year, in June, and the other one takes place at the opening of the new academic year in late September, early October. They both have the participation and support of several civil associations in Portugal, including the Oxford Society of Portugal, the Royal British Club, and the British Historical Society of Portugal. And each of them, both of those events usually have about 200 people attending and participating. Now, just uh, to add to this, let me uh, explain some, some distinguishing features. The opening of the academic year in October takes place at the beautiful presidential palace in Qashqais by the sea in a 16th century uh, castle. And it has the high patronage of the president of the Portuguese Republic who has actually participated in several um, events. Now, the other one in June um, takes place at the classical Estoril uh, uh, Palace Hotel, which was the hotel of the Anglo-American allies during the Second World War. Um, now, what, what else can I add? I, I'm delighted to be speaking to you from the Churchill Room at my institute in Lisbon. And behind me, you can see a copy of the famous painting of Winston Churchill. On my right-hand side, you can see a copy of Magna Carta, signed 1215. And last but certainly not least, over there, you can see a copy of the Treaty of Windsor, uh, signed in 1386, which uh, is still in force, and it is the oldest alliance between Portugal and England. Thank you all very much and we all look forward to welcoming you to one of our churching events in Estoril or Cascais uh, as soon as possible. Thank you. Well, welcome back from Washington DC to Lisbon to Cambridge. 
Hopefully Justin's quiz question has warmed you up for a bit of a challenge because it's now time for our 10 minute challenge Churchill quiz. Um, as I hope you all know by now, there are a number of ways in which you can, you can play along. If you've printed out the quiz PDF, you can record your answers on that. You can play along with me in the main screen, or you can scroll down to the interactive quiz screen where you can select your multiple choice answer and see how many people are voting the same way as you. Um, however you play along, you're going to need to keep track of your own score because at this stage we're playing for honour, not for prizes. This is for fun. And in each case, I will give the answer or, or actually in, in some cases the person posing the question will give the answer. Um, so it won't, the answers won't appear on your quiz screen below. So we've got six taxing quiz questions for you. Um, and for our first one, we're going to go to a familiar face in California. Hi, I'm David Freeman, editor of Finest Hour, the journal of the International Churchill Society. My question is what is the title of Winston Churchill's only published novel? The title of Winston Churchill's only published novel. Is it A, Spy and Cop, B, From London to Ladysmith via Pretoria, C, Savrola, or D, Mr. Broderick's Army? The choices again are A, Spy and Cop, B, From London to Ladysmith via Pretoria, C, Savrola, or D, Mr. Broderick's Army. So Churchill was, of course, an incredibly prolific writer. He won the Nobel Prize for Literature, but almost all of his works were non-fiction. What David asked you was, what was his only novel? And the answer is, David? And the answer to this question is, in fact, C. Savrola, Winston Churchill's only published novel. Okay, that was question one. Question two, we're going to go to Chartwell and to Catherine Carter, the senior collections and house manager there. Here is my quiz question. What year did Winston Churchill and his family move into Chartwell? Okay, so Catherine has asked you, what year did Winston Churchill and his family move into Chartwell? And your choices are A, 1920, B, 1921, C, 1922, or D, 1924? And the correct answer, Catherine, is... I asked you, what year did Winston Churchill and his family move into Chartwell? If you said 1922, you are close, but no cigar, because that's the year that he bought the house. But it took two years of remodelling and refurbishment to make it ready. And so he and his family moved in in 1924. So a slightly trick question there, I think, from Catherine. Um, we're now for our third question, going to go north of the border and to Scott Johnson. My name is Scott Johnson and I'm the treasurer of the International Churchill Society in the United Kingdom. My question is this. Churchill lost the 1922 general election, ironically, to the Scottish Prohibition Party candidate Edwin Scrimger, a man a pioneer of the temperance movement. In which Scottish city was the constituency? Was it A, Edinburgh, B, Glasgow, C, Dundee, or D, Stirling? Good luck. Okay, so Churchill famously said that uh, he had taken more out of alcohol than alcohol had taken out of him. But he came up against his match um, with a prohibitionist candidate in Dundee. Oh, oh, oh I may have, may have just slipped up there. So Scott asked you wh where, um, uh, which, which city um, 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 Churchill faced a Scottish prohibitionist candidate. Was it A, Edinburgh, B, Glasgow, C, Dundee? or D, Sterling? And Scott, the answer is? As we raise a glass to the demise of the Scottish prohibitionists, the answer is, of course, Dundee. Cheers. 
Okay, and for our fourth question of six, we're going to go to Winston Churchill's granddaughter, Emma Soames, who you'll be seeing more of in the programme later on this afternoon. My question would be, who wrote Who's in Charge of the Clattering Train, which was a poem greatly beloved by my grandfather, and he used to recite it at dinner, particularly in the 1930s, um, during when he was in the wilderness and during the appeasement years. Okay, so Emma has asked you, who wrote the poem, The Clattering Train? And the options that you have are A, William Wordsworth, B, Edwin Millican, C, Churchill himself, and D, Alfred Lord Tennyson. Those are your four choices. Make your selection now. And Emma, the answer is? The answer is, it was The Clattering Train was written by the then editor of Punch magazine, Edwin J. Millikan. Yeah, I think that was a pretty hard question and not one that, that I would have got. But for our fifth question, we're going to go to Derek Greenwell. Hello, I'm Derek Greenwell, the chairman of the conference committee for ICS UK. My question is as follows. What was Churchill referring to when he said, you would not have thought it was a game at all, but a matter of life and death? Was it A, politics, B, golf, C, polo, or D, fencing? Okay, well, we all know, and, and we've learned by now over the course of these two days, that Churchill was a man of many interests. But what to him was a matter of life or death? I hope you've had a chance to make your selection. Back to Derek for the answer. And the answer to my question is C, polo. And the final question, question six of six, comes from me and comes from this room in Churchill College, Cambridge, the college that was founded as the British National and Commonwealth Memorial to Sir Winston Churchill. I'm standing here in the Cockroft Room, named for Sir John Cockroft, the first master of Churchill College. But for which discipline did Sir John Cockroft win his Nobel Prize? Was it A, physics, B, literature, C, peace, or D, chemistry? So that's A, physics, B, literature, C, peace, or D, chemistry. I hope you had a chance to make your selection. The answer is A, physics. Sir John Cockcroft won his Nobel Prize for his pioneering work on the disintegration of atoms, working under Lord Rutherford in the Cavendish Laboratories in the 1930s. So, six questions, six answers. I might have given you a very heavy hint on one of them, um, so hopefully no one has come away with nothing. But if you've got five or six out of six, then I think you can award yourself the Order of the Garter. If you've only got one or none, then I'm afraid it's the order of the boot for you. But in a way, that was just a rehearsal um, because that was for fun. We now have another one of our serious quiz questions um, with a wonderful prize. So the first three, well, the three correct emails drawn at random, three correct emails drawn at random sent to um, 2020 at winstonchurchill.org will win copies of the new book, Daughters of Yalta, by Catherine Katz. And you're going to be hearing from Catherine in one of the sessions very shortly. So a fantastic prize. The question that uh, you, you need to answer is going to be asked by my colleague here in the UK, Andy Smith. My name is Andy Smith, and I am the Executive Director of the International Churchill Society in the United Kingdom. Three lucky people who send us the correct answer to this particular question by email will receive a copy of the wonderful new book by Catherine Katz titled Daughters of Yalta. 
Churchill's speech at Westminster College, Fulton, Missouri, has become famous as the Iron Curtain speech. But by what other name is it commonly known? Is it A, the Russian speech? B, the sinews of peace? C, the warning? Or D, another prophecy? Okay, so you haven't got long. You need to get your emails in. And as I say, free correct entries drawn at random will win copies of Catherine Katz's um, new book. And Andy's question again was, by what other name is the Iron Curtain speech commonly known? Was it A, the Russian speech? B, the sinews of peace? C, the warning? Or D, another prophecy? Do get emailing now. Well, that was a feat of memory. And Churchill had a, a prodigious memory, but he also relied on others to help him. And our next session features some of the women who helped sustain Sir Winston in his professional and personal life. And to tell us more, here is someone who you've just seen on the screen. It's Catherine Carter from Chartwell. The Churchill world can often seem like a male-dominated one with much focus, for example, on his relationship with the suffragettes. But look deeper into his life and legacy, and you can see that both were and continue to be sustained by women. His mother, Jenny, was integral into helping launch his literary and political career. His wife, Clementine, was his rock, his most trusted advisor and confidant, as well as being a public figure in her own right, and one of the few people who can make him change his mind. His three daughters all wore military uniform during the Second World War, with Mary and Sarah joining him at a number of key events. He was also served and sustained by a loyal group of female secretaries, and in time became increasingly reliant on female MPs, for example, Violet Bonham Carter. Since his death, he has been written about by female historians, including Sonia Purnell, Sita Stelza, and now Catherine Katz. And that is in addition, of course, to the wonderful publications made by his daughter, Mary, and his granddaughter, Celia. It is a woman, Dame Eleanor Lang, who represents his former constituency in Essex. And I, of course, find myself in the very lucky position of getting to manage his home and his beloved possessions. So we thought we should get the female perspective. I am Sita Stelzer. I've written two books about Winston Churchill. The first one is Dinner with Churchill, Policy Making at the Dinner Table. And the second one is Working with Winston, the Unsung Women Behind Britain's Greatest Statesman. On the second book, when I was researching one aspect of the dinners book, I found a listing of oral histories in the archives. I went right to them and realized that there were 11 or 12 oral histories with female secretaries that to my knowledge, no one had really listened to or transcribed. And I thought to myself, that is a really interesting book, if possible. After I listened to the transcriptions, I knew that this, that they all showed a side of Winston Churchill that had never come out before. Because Churchill worked all the time, he worked on political, governmental, financial, military, personal matters, and a very active social life with family and friends. He needed a staff of personal secretaries to take down, that's what he called take dictation. He dictated everything, memos, directives, letters, and especially the many drafts of his speeches. And of course his books, all of which were dictated as first drafts, edited, and then retyped sometimes, many times over. All the young ladies, quote, as he called them, were intelligent and extremely well organized that they would have to keep track of the huge variety of work incoming and outgoing and of the filing systems this required. A secretary was with him during the first thing in the morning and last time at night, every day, including most Christmas days. Later on, many traveled with him to summit meetings with President Roosevelt 
and Marshal Stalin, as well as around his own country on political business. And to race courses, of course, when his horses were running, which they loved. He was utterly dependent on this group of intrepid and well-trained young women. His interviewing method was unusual. After vetting by others, he would look at them and ask them if he wanted to work for him. Every one of them understandably said, yes. Yes, Churchill could sometimes be short-tempered, overly demanding under the pressure of work, especially during the war, but he never let the sun go down on his anger or frustrations, as Celia Sands often reminds us. Many of the secretaries tell similar stories of what it was like to work with him. When he realized he might have been short with the secretary, he might smile at them or make a quip and all would be forgiven. His impish humor at times of stress could work miracles to relieve the tension in the room. And for some of the secretaries, he invented clever nicknames, which they all were very proud of. And Churchill could be generous. For instance, uh, when Violet Pierman, uh, who was one of his very first secretaries, died at an early age, he paid for her daughter's nursing education. And he was very courteous to them. As Doreen Pugh recalls, and I quote, he would never have used my Christian name as he was from a past age. He treated everyone with terrific respect, tremendously polite, close quote. All the women worked well together as they had to, since all the work was shared. Dictation taken down in the morning, typed in the afternoon, and reworked sometimes until 2 or 3 a.m. to get it done. When the workload increased, one of them would work straight through for 12 hours. They considered themselves Churchill's team. He named his team the Secret Circle, which cemented their feelings of being part of something important, which they were. Churchill's colleagues, the generals, the admirals, and MPs, plus friends and family, all agreed that the smooth working of Churchill's office, whether in or out of government, was essential to his life. And his personal secretaries, his personal female secretaries, made that happen. All of them ended up adoring him, as is clear from listening to their voices on these audio tapes, as they chuckled or laughed, as they vividly recounted their memories of working with him. They remembered the personal and wonderfully human Winston Churchill, and we can too through their voices. My name is Jane Williams. In 1949, I was Jane Portal, age 19. It was my first job to go and work for Winston Churchill, who was at that point leader of the opposition, the Conservative Party in opposition. So he was intent at that point in finishing writing his war memoirs six volumes they were. When I got there in 1949, he was on volume four. Well, Winston Churchill, as everybody knows, was in love with the English language. And all his thoughts needed to be articulated. And that was why he had us secretaries the, as I said, in opposition, there were five of us. When he went to number 10 in 1951 as Prime Minister, he took two of us, Elizabeth Gilliard and myself. We did all his personal dictation. And wherever he was, he would not be aware of us. He would be speaking these wonderful thoughts, um, whatever came into his mind. Um, he would wake whatever time he'd gone to bed. He would wake at 7.30 in the morning and have stay, and he would stay in his bedroom working all morning, working on the government boxes, seeing people, dictating, writing speeches, everything. But the work took place in his bedroom, number 10. Uh, and it seemed perfectly normal that everybody was perfectly happy with this. Um, then he would have a quiet lunch, if possible, with his family, Lady Churchill and his family. And I may say at this point, 
he was devoted to his family. He saw them frequently, especially at Chartwell, of course, because at number 10, he was busy the whole time. But he would have lunch quietly with Lady Churchill. And then after lunch, he would go to the House of Commons. But this was, he had to have usually me with him in the car going to the House of Commons because he wanted to dictate. Wherever he went walking about, he was dictating. And um, he would, used to say, I would have the government box on the seat in front of me in the car, even going from number 10 to the House of Commons, House's apartment. And he would say, we can do three. And he would dictate three answers to papers. And when we got out, um, I would follow him along the passage to his room, and he would stay in the House of Commons. On Thursdays, he would go to Chartwell um, at half past four in the afternoon, uh, because as you know, Chartwell was for him his place of tranquility and home. And we would get in the car from the house's apartment Thursday, half past four, always punctual then, call in at number 10, pick up Rufus the poodle, who would sit on the arm of the chair between us, and we would go down to Chartwell. This was so long ago, 1950s, there were no motorways. So when we arrived at uh, Crystal Palace, he would take in the Evening Standard from the newspaper man on the corner, always the same corner, the same newspaper man, lovely man. And Churchill would take the remains of his cigar, which would be half his cigar would be left and give it to this lovely newspaper man. And um, I, I can see his face to this day when I think of the number of cigars, half cigars he must have collected. And we go on to Chartwell. And if it was still daylight, he would not go into the house. He would take a bowl of fish food and walk around Chartwell with a detective um, and feed his fish and go down and speak to the black swans. And um, I remember he was so happy that Chartwell, I'd get on with the office but this was a Thursday, there'd be nobody else there. In the evening, there'd be a family dinner with his daughter, Mary Sertens, and his son-in-law, Christopher Sertens. And that would be a very happy occasion. And I would be working in the office. And after dinner, this was his best, best time for dictation. He would come to the office to study at Chartwell. And I would be sitting with a typewriter on a desk and he would dictate straight to me onto the typewriter the work he had to do because he never let up on this concentrated getting through the papers, uh, the government papers he needed. And so we would, he would go on dictating, walking. He had this great energy, you see. And he would walk up and down the room dictating in his satin and suit until maybe two o'clock in the morning. And um, I have to say that I, as practically everyone who ever came into Churchill's orbit, loved him deeply as a person. Uh, we were prepared to do anything, and I mean anything he wished at all times and in all situations. He never asked any of us to toil harder than he drove himself. He possessed the most phenomenal energy and the gift of focusing with single-minded concentration on the job in hand. And so that was the feeling always, it was a good feeling that we would just do anything. He, um, patience was a virtue 
with which he had no familiarity at all. And um, so there would be explosions of temper. And I remember I used to get out of the room, actually. But um, it was frustration. It was never personal. And I think he was like that with everybody. He was never personal in his anger with people. It was with the situation that they represented. And there would never... The day would not go by when, in the evening perhaps, after the, in the explosion of temper, he would, that I'd have the smile. And thank goodness he didn't apologize. That would have been awful. But he would smile and he had the most beautiful smile. So all was forgiven. Lady Churchill was, of course, his strength and his stay. Uh, she was such a wonderful woman with such beauty and this lovely presence of calm and peace in the house. Um, and um, his family, you see, the Soames family lived down the hill in the farm at near Chartwell, and they were with him the whole time. Um, the children would come running in in the morning and run up to him, say hello to him in his room. Uh, that is Emma and Nicholas. In February 1953, uh, uh, the King, George VI, died. And as you know, the young Queen and Prince Philip were in Kenya. And they had to come back. Churchill was to broadcast to the nation that night. And they were coming back by air to what was then London Airport. And Churchill, as was his uh, habit, he needed to write the broadcast very, very carefully. He hadn't completed it. So I went down in the car with him to London Airport. And he had this wonderfully romantic, loving, admiring relationship with the Queen, who he'd known since she was a teenager, of course. And um, he was feeling it very deeply. Now, one thing I have, Churchill wept constantly. He used to say to Jock Colville, you've got to use, get used to me weeping because I weep quite a lot. And I think he wept more beautifully than anybody I've ever seen. His face was completely tranquil, but the tears would pour down his face. And in the car on the way to the airport, he wept as he spoke. And um, I remember taking all this down in shorthand, and then we arrived at the airport and there's that wonderful photograph, which you've probably got, of the back view of the cabinet lined up to meet this young queen as she came off the aeroplane. The sturdy figure background, back of Churchill, next to him, the elegance of Anthony Eaton, the foreign secretary, and so on down the line um, of the cabinet. And on the way home, he didn't dictate at all. He just sat quite quietly, rather pale, but with tears. And this is an occasion that I shall never, never forget. Hello, I'm Noni, and I started working at Chartwell in April 1964. I was really only a general factotum, um, which did uh, included all sorts of bits and pieces. I used to go in the mornings and see Lady Churchill in her dressing room and see if there was any errands that she wanted me to do. And then I would go and see the cook and get the shopping list for the cook. And then I would probably go to Oxted Station to collect at Sir Anthony Montague Brown, Anthony Montague Brown as he was then, Sir Winston's private secretary who would come down every day on the train and take him back to Chartwell. And when I got back to Chartwell, I was really working. I worked, 
under Grace Hamlin, who was a long time Churchill secretary, the most wonderful person. And I would um, go into Grace's office and help her with some secretarial work or literally anything that needed doing. And I was really only there in the mornings, but Lady Churchill would often say to me, um, in the summer, um, Charlotte and Rupert Soames, who were very little then, would come to stay with their nanny while the rest of the family went to Scotland. And when Charlotte and Rupert were staying, Lady Churchill would say to me, if it's, it's a lovely afternoon today, why don't you come back, bring your swimming things, and we'll have a picnic in the garden. So I used to go back in the afternoon and swim in that freezing cold swimming pool, and we'd all have a lovely picnic in the garden. And um, then in the evenings, I would go back um, if there was a, a, a film. Um, at weekends, they used to have films in the cinema, which was, if you go to Chartwell now, it's actually laid out as the dining room. But for Sir Winston's 80th birthday, Alexander Calder gave him um, cinematic equipment. And uh, there was a wonderful um, man who lived in Westrum who used to come and show the films. And at weekends when they had visitors staying after dinner, probably on a Saturday, they would have a film in the evening and all the staff would come, we'd all sit and watch the film. So Winston would come in in his um, velvet siren suit. He had a green one, a blue one, and um, a burgundy one, and his WSC slippers. And he would come shuffling in and sit down and watch the film. Let it go, he would say. And then um, we'd all sit and see, I think I remember seeing Lawrence of Arabia there, possibly an early James Bond. And I mean, it was amazing. And then um, if Sir Winston's cigar went out in the middle of the film, he'd put up his hands um, and Roy Howells, who was his male nurse, would come around and relight his cigar for him. And the one thing I really noticed about him was he had such artistic long fingers, amazing. Um, it, it, that really struck me. Um, the atmosphere in the house at Chartwell was simply wonderful. Uh, Lady Churchill loved flowers. There were flowers everywhere, all grown in the garden. And um, if it was cold, log fires burning everywhere. I remember Winston Churchill through being a volunteer at Chartwell because Chartwell is just full of him and the family. It was just such an amazing experience to have worked for the family for so long. Hello, um, I'm Emma Soames. I am the um, eldest daughter and second child of Mary Soames, who was, of course, Mary Churchill and Winston Churchill's youngest daughter. Well, I was born at Chartwell Farm, which is the little farmhouse in the valley just underneath Chartwell. Uh, the first seven, eight years of my life were spent between Chartwell Farm and Chartwell. So I saw a great deal of my grandparents, Winston and Clementine. When I remember my grandfather, um, of course, my memories are not incredibly sharp because I was a very, very small child. But um, my very first and abiding memory of him was of him sitting outside in a very comfortable chair with a rug over his knees, of course, a cigar in his hand and a huge Stetson hat with his detective sitting at a discreet distance and with all of us children playing around him. But he was always surrounded by love, really. Um, you could sense, even as a four-year-old child, that um, he was the 
heart and hearth of that house and that the entire thing revolved around him, his health and his happiness. And he was greatly beloved by his family. Um, and that was really my first impression of him. Um, also that and the fact that he was surrounded by animals, which I thought was an absolutely terrific um, idea. He had a poodle um, with these huge goldfish that we used to go and feed with him. Um, there was horrible black swans on the lake at the bottom. And lest we forget, he had a swimming pool. Um, which in those days was something pretty rare and in those days something pretty cold too. Um, so I have vivid memories of that. There were many people at Chartwell sort of coming and going, but there was a core of people, nearly all women, who were there all the time. Obviously, my grandmother who I have to say I regard as responsible for this extraordinary atmosphere at Chartwell. Um, but then also my mother, um, he loved my mother dearly. And I remember at lunches at Chartwell, um, he used to sit at the end of lunch and my mother would be go and sit next to him. And they used to have, my mother also smoked cigars. They used to have a competition to see who could grow the longest ash tail on their cigars. And my grandfather was very, very miffed if he didn't win. And I also remember in the secretary's room, the most amazing bits of stationery that were very exciting to a child. Um, bits of, you know, string that held speeches together, um, things that said action this day, maps on the wall. Um, and then I remember always um, an extremely good cook. Um, I don't think it was Mrs. Landmar at this point. I think she'd retired. But there were... Um, basically lots of loving people who were very keen to make my grandfather happy and comfortable. My parents were very, very intent on not blowing up their children's heads um, about the importance of their grandfather. Um, so they were very, very keen that we think of him as a loving grandfather rather than as the greatest Englishman. Um, so it wasn't really till I went to school that I started getting an inkling of how well known he was. And most of all, it wasn't really till his funeral that I realized what an extraordinary, important global figure he was. I have I'm getting fresh insights into my mother's relationship with her father by the work I'm currently doing, which is editing uh, Mary Churchill, private Mary Churchill's wartime <laughs> diaries, which um, with the Churchill Archive Centre, I'm working on um, to be published um, in the autumn of next year. And in regards to her father, I have never read anywhere such love and reverence of somebody a, a woman has for her father. And what is fascinating about her diaries is that they open when she's 17 in 1939, and her sort of respect and love for him grows as she becomes an adult woman and as the war progresses and indeed the news becomes worse and worse really initially and um it's just it's very moving and it's very real um and i am sort of so thrilled that my mother was able to play such really quite an instrumental part in his life in giving him the sort of support 
he needed from his family. Well, as you can imagine, it was a real thrill and a real pleasure to be involved in those interviews with Sita, Jane, Noni and Emma and to hear their wonderful recollections. At the beginning um, of that section, Catherine Carter mentioned Dame Eleanor Lang. Um, Dame Eleanor is the Deputy Speaker in the British Houses of Parliament, in the, in the House of Commons, um, and is also the Member of Parliament um, who has inherited Churchill's old constituency in Epping. And Dame Eleanor was due to participate in this conference, um, but as you can imagine, um, at this time of adversity, um, her parliamentary duties have to come first. So she sends her apologies and she has sent me a note to read out. And she says, it's wonderful that the unusual circumstances in which our conference is taking place has allowed such a large number of us to gather, to remember and celebrate Winston Churchill. I have the honour of representing in the House of Commons the constituency which Winston represented for decades. We still have active members of Epping Forest Conservative Association who vividly remember working with Winston when they were young. We're also delighted that Randolph continues the family connection with Epping Forest in his role as patron of our Conservative Association. In these unprecedented times, it has never been more important to keep in the forefront of our minds the indomitable spirit of Winston Churchill. I can hear him saying in that famous address to Harrow School, never, never, never give in. So thank you to Dame Eleanor for sending that message. The role played by women in supporting Churchill um, is a theme that will continue into our next session. So it's now nearly four o'clock here in the UK, nearly 11 a.m. in the US East Coast, and of course, 10 a.m. in Fulton, Missouri. And it's to Fulton that we're going to go to next for a live session that will be chaired by Tim Riley, the Sandra L. and Munro Trout Director and Chief Curator of America's National Churchill Museum. The museum is located in the basement of an historic reconstructed Wren church at the site where Churchill delivered his famous Iron Curtain speech. That speech in which he famously said, from Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic, an Iron Curtain has descended across the continent. And it's to Fulton we go now. It is because I am sure that our fortunes are still in our hands, in our own hands, and that we hold the power to save the future, that I feel the duty to speak out now. People often ask, you know, how significant was the Iron Curtain speech? And I often reply, it changed the world. In the year 1946, Europe is still uh, recovering in the wake of a global conflict. Uh, it's a tumultuous time politically. Uh, the world is still unstable. Uh, and it's in that context that a new threat is bubbling up in Eastern Europe. Uh, that threat is the Soviet Union. Uh, and as uh, the Soviet Union increases its power base in post-World War II Europe, there's one man uh, who sees it all coming, and that's Winston Churchill. Uh, and Churchill warns to anyone who will listen uh, that this looming threat of the Soviet Union and of communism is one that needs to be reckoned with. In 1945, after VE Day in Europe, Churchill lost an election uh, and was no longer prime minister. Uh, and it was uh, in that environment that he receives a, a rather bold invitation uh, from the president of Westminster College, Frank McClure, who invites Churchill to Fulton, Missouri. Uh, and it was here uh, in this small mid-America town uh, that Churchill chose to deliver uh, arguably the most significant speech uh, of the 20th century. From Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic, an iron curtain has descended across the continent. Uh, and it is this juxtaposition of this small, rural, everyday America town, full Americana, is on display here in Fulton, where we see the world begin to change. 
Well, the National Churchill Museum at Westminster College uh, is a multifaceted, uh, multi-layered historical site. Uh, not only did uh, Winston Churchill deliver his Iron Curtain speech here in 1946, marking arguably the beginning of the Cold War, this is a space where we've reconstructed stone by stone a 17th century Christopher Wren church that was bombed in the Blitz in World War II and relocated stone by stone from London to Fulton. Uh, this was an idea that uh, Winston Churchill himself knew about and embraced and endorsed. Uh, so we have great British history meeting great American history and creating a world history. And to cap it all off, uh, we have eight sections of the Berlin Wall. The concrete manifestation of the Iron Curtain that Churchill warns about is installed here on the campus of Westminster College. When Congress established this as the National Churchill Museum, uh, we took that very seriously. And we reach audiences across the country, uh, from coast to coast, and really throughout the world. Uh, they come here to Fulton, Missouri at Westminster College to explore uh, Winston Churchill in, in a profound way. We've created exhibitions uh, and displays that are interactive and visceral in nature. You can walk through a World War I trench and hear recordings of what it might have sounded like uh, to be in such a trench, or you can experience the sights and sounds and almost even, if you imagine, the smells of the Blitz in London uh, through our interactive experiences here. Uh, it's a chance for visitors to uh, not only uh, read about, but almost to feel history uh, as it unfolded in some of the 20th century's most challenging hours. History comes alive here. History continues to happen here, uh, and it's that uh, quality of this museum uh, that sets it apart and visitors walk away I think refreshed, enriched and continually inspired by Winston Churchill, his leadership and his legacy. The sun never sets on the Churchill world, it seems. Uh, we're broadcasting or live streaming here live from Westminster College at America's National Churchill Museum. My name is Tim Riley. I'm the director and chief curator here. And uh, we are this morning here in Fulton uh, in the historic church of St. Mary the Virgin Aldermanbury, uh, the 17th century historic church that was originally built in London, where it stood for 300 years very proudly in service until a fateful night on December 29th, 1940, 80 years ago, when the German Luf Luftwaffe dropped 20,000 incendiary bombs on London, uh, nearly destroying this uh, edifice, this building. It stood in ruins in London for nearly 25 years until it was relocated stone by stone here to Fulton uh, at, on the college campus of Westminster College, uh, where it now stands as the largest work in the collection of America's National Churchill Museum. I'm very pleased uh, to be joining you using 21st century technology in a decidedly 17th century setting. Um, we will be joined shortly here by two uh, very distinguished uh, speakers who will be sharing with us some of their thoughts uh, on this section, which we are calling from Yalta to Fulton to today. And we'll explore some seminal moments uh, in the, at the end of World War II uh, that transitions from World War II into the Cold War. Uh, and we'll continue our discussion by talking about how some of the legacies of those seminal moments of history uh, still impact uh, the world today. We are joined today uh, by two speakers. Uh, first, Catherine Katz, uh, author, uh, historian, uh, who is joining us. And her, her brand new book uh, is, is a delightful read. If you haven't read it, it's, it's Daughters of Yalta. Uh, it, 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 it's, a, it's a wonderful, wonderful look at that conference that is familiar to most Churchillians. But what is unfamiliar uh, are, are the three women who played such a, an important role uh, at that conference. And Catherine, who's the author of Daughters of Yalta, uh, will be joining us. And we're also going to be joined uh, today by Professor David Reynolds, uh, whose book, The Kremlin Letters, uh, documents the correspondence between Stalin, 
Churchill and President Roosevelt uh, throughout the war. It also is a terrific and excellent resources. So we are in very, very good hands today uh, as we're joined by these wonderful speakers. The way it will work is we'll listen first to Catherine Katz, uh, who will speak for about 15 minutes or so, uh, then from Professor Reynolds, then we'll join uh, the three of us to take your questions uh, for these uh, distinguished speakers uh, and explore this conversation uh, in depth. So uh, first up, I'd like to welcome and introduce uh, Catherine Katz, whose new book, as I mentioned, Daughters of Yalta, is a must read if you haven't already read it. It just came out and we're very, very delighted to have you with us uh, from Chicago, Catherine. Uh, welcome to Fulton virtually uh, and to the world via this Churchill conference. Catherine, we're very pleased to have you with us. Um, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Tim. It is such a pleasure to be joining you today. I am so excited uh, for a number of reasons, also personally to be able to do this with Professor Reynolds, who was my supervisor at Cambridge. So this is a uh, great fun, not only for the content, but also the uh, gathering of individuals we have today. So I wanted to start today by sharing a very famous photograph with you. This is a, the famous photograph from the Yalta Conference. It was taken on February 8th, 1945, and it shows the, the big three, Churchill, FDR, and Stalin with their military leaders gathered behind them. From their faces, you can see that the toll of the war has, you know, has been heavy. And also the last few days debating over the outcome of the, the post-war world and their hopes for peace have really been weighing on their minds. But we also discount what it took to get there. To get to Yalta, it meant Churchill and Roosevelt had to come to Stalin. Uh, Stalin, at this point, he's claiming that his doctors advise him against traveling. It would be bad for his health. But in reality, he doesn't want to leave the safety of his security apparatus in the Soviet Union. And over the course of the war, the balance of power has shifted. The Soviet Union is on the rise, while Britain's power is significantly diminished. So Churchill and Roosevelt agreed to make this long voyage, thousands of miles, Churchill first by air, and very tragically, uh, one of their planes carrying foreign office uh, representatives uh, is lost on the way. Um, FDR has to make the voyage by sea uh, with a ship convoy, and they're still sighting U-boats on their way there. So this is an incredibly dangerous and arduous journey. They meet first in Malta, where they have a planning session together before then flying a further almost 1,400 miles to the Crimea. And this is flying over enemy occupied territory where there are still enemy uh, anti-aircraft units. And it's a very, very dangerous trip. One that we can't imagine any leaders who are meeting for a grand summit would undertake today. Once they arrive in the Crimea, uh, they're meeting at Lavadia Palace on the Black Sea. This was once the summer palace of Tsar Nicholas II and his family. It was a, a, a lovely retreat away from the hustle and bustle of court. And they really did treat it as a, a family home. This palace is the embodiment of contradictions between extreme graciousness and splendor, but also primitiveness and destruction that lies just beyond the grounds. The Crimea has been scarred by years of war, but also by the uh, Soviet state-sponsored famine that came before it. And while this palace is beautiful and it has all the, the trimmings of royalty, the surrounding areas have been absolutely devastated. And until just three weeks before the conference, Lavadia was in a, a similar state. The Nazis had used Lavadia Palace as their Crimean headquarters. And when the Soviets finally pushed them out of the Crimea just uh, shortly before this, they took everything with them of value that they could carry. They absolutely stripped the palace, taking the furniture, the art, the lamps, even down to the doorknobs, and there was nothing left. So the Soviets had to entirely restock this villa using the contents of places like the Hotel Metropole and the Hotel National and carting everything by train thousand miles south to the Crimea to put together a makeshift uh, environment for the week of this very important conference. Once at Yalta, uh, they were discussing many issues about the, uh, the post-war world. There are four uh, main topics of conversation that uh, I you know, want to focus on here just briefly as a reminder, uh, we think today of Yalta as at this moment on the precipice between World War and Cold War, but at the time they are still very hopeful for uh, a positive outcome and hopefully a lasting peace. The war in Europe is finally drawing to an end. The race is on to see who will liberate Berlin. 
Pacific, they're still not, uh, not quite uh, with the end in sight, but things are improving. So one of the four main issues is what to do about Germany in the post-war world. Should Germany be allowed to be a one state or should it be broken into smaller states and hope that they will not be uh, able to rise up in belligerents once more? Also very important is the matter of Polish sovereignty. Britain went to war to guarantee Polish sovereignty at the outset and Churchill doesn't want to return home from Yalta without be being able to make this honest you know, agreement with his uh, colleagues, his, the Polish government in exile that's been in London since the beginning of the war to say that, you know, he wants to say that the reason we went to war is uh, we will be successful in the end, but Stalin has other ideas, no matter what he's saying publicly. The Soviet Union is determined to have friendly neighbors on their borders. They've been invaded through Poland multiple times throughout history, and he wants to make sure that at the end, the government in, Mo in uh, Poland is going to be friendly to the interests in Moscow. And unfortunately for Churchill, Stalin's Red Army is firmly in control of the area. Also very important to Franklin Roosevelt is hopefully drawing the Soviets into the war in the Pacific. The Soviets and the Japanese have long had a pact of neutrality. At this point, FDR doesn't yet know if the atomic bomb will be successful. So he's looking at a potential uh, invasion of the home islands at potentially a cost of 200,000 American lives. And so he's hoping to draw the Soviets into the Pacific in exchange for territorial concessions in hopes of saving as many Americans as possible. And finally, there's the matter of forming the United Nations. This is very important to FDR personally. He wants to succeed where Wilson has failed uh, with, the, with the League of Nations after World War I. And while he doesn't believe that it's realistic to imagine you could secure peace forever, he does believe it's possible to have 50 years of peace in Europe. And he also sees the United Nations as a way of drawing the Soviet Union into the international community in the post-war world. So we look at this photograph and this is an example of you know, a moment in history that we think we know so well. Yalta has been written about many times. However, this is also a, an image that uh, is a, a bit of a red herring in a sense because there's another photograph taken from just a slightly different angle at the same moment and you can see a different picture. Just off to the side, you can see the shapes of uh, two women. There were actually three women there. These women are the daughters of Winston Churchill, Franklin Roosevelt, and Ambassador Avril Harriman. Sarah Churchill was 30 years old. Uh, you can see her uh, in her military uniform. Anna Roosevelt in the middle is 38, and Kathleen Harriman is just 27. And so I you know, became very fascinated. You know, what was the role of these three women there? What, how, what was their place in one that we know so little about? Very little has been written about them, and yet they occupied this fascinating role where they're both daughters and diplomats. And also, it says something significant about the relationship between these daughters and their father is that of all the people they could have chosen to take with them as their aides at Yalta, why did these fathers choose to bring their daughters? It also casts a much more personal light on the Yalta conference because we think of these summits of history these great men of history in all capital letters, we put them up on a pedestal. And sometimes that history can feel very out of touch for people. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, these people are humans like anyone else and they're also someone's father. And what would it be like to be one of the people in the world who looks at these individuals who we revere, um, but they think of them just as dad. So I'll stop sharing my screen now. I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about each of the women. Uh, so Sarah Churchill, uh, was, as I mentioned, was 30 years old. And if you know her, um, sometimes you know her as an actress. She was in a movie with Fred Astaire uh, in 1951 called Royal Wedding. But before this, as a child, she was very close to her father. She was very shy and nervous at times, but she felt that she had this bond with her father and that she understood the way his mind worked. Even if they weren't speaking, she felt that they were very much in harmony. And some of this came from her childhood experience of uh, spending long hours with him in the gardens of their home at Chartwell, where he would be engaged in one of his favorite pastimes of bricklaying. And Sarah was his uh, chosen assistant. Sarah would uh, end up going into the theater, one of the few careers open to women of her position and class at the time, albeit a, a rebellious decision, but one that her father didn't completely oppose. Um, they were at odds very briefly when she decided to run off with the star of her show, who was significantly older than she was and an Austrian citizen. Um, but the marriage didn't last, sadly. And by the time the war came, it was largely over. Um, and Sarah decides that she wants to leave the stage and do her bit for her country. 
as inspired by her father. And so she decides to join the Women's Auxiliary Air Force, the women's branch of the RAF, where she becomes an aerial reconnaissance intelligence officer. And Sarah, she goes on to uh, be highly informed of the very detailed uh, specifics of allied operations, such as uh, the operations in the Mediterranean. And Winston's very proud of his daughter for her work, sometimes bragging about her, sometimes even uh, going so far as to accidentally leak classified information and sharing his pride about her. Um, but when it comes time for the Tehran conference, the first meeting of the big three, he decides to take Sarah with him as his aide at Tehran, where her background as an actress and her experience as a WAF has given her this wonderful balance of the, the interpersonal relationships uh, needed in diplomacy as well as the technical expertise. And at Tehran, Franklin Roosevelt and Abel Harriman both realize what an asset she is to her father and just how valuable this daughter diplomat role can be. Kathleen Harriman at 27 was the youngest of the three women. She is the daughter of William Abel Harriman, the ambassador to the Soviet Union, Prior to the war, he had been the chairman of Union Pacific Railroad, uh, the founder of Brown Brothers Harriman, Newsweek Magazine, the, the ski resort Sun Valley. He's one of the wealthiest men in America. And they did not have an especially close relationship when she was a little girl. And it's only after her mother dies when she's a teenager that they find their way back to each other through this shared love of sport and adventure. She spends her college vacations working with him at Sun Valley. And when the war breaks out uh, and Franklin Roosevelt uh, taps F, uh, uh, Abel Harriman to become the Lend-Lease Envoy in London, Harriman decides it would be a wonderful opportunity for his daughter Kathleen to come with him and have this experience of working as a war reporter in the middle of the Blitz. So with Harry Hopkins' assistance, he secures a visa for her and off she goes and spends the next four years at her father's side. Once in London, they become very close friends with the Churchill family. They're even celebrating Kathleen's 24th birthday when they learn about uh, the news about Pearl Harbor. And in 1943, when Harriman becomes the ambassador to the Soviet Union, Kathleen again goes with him. She learns Russian for both of them, becomes very skilled in this way. And she really has more access to Stalin's inner circle than any other American woman in history. Their relationship is in a sense more like business colleagues or uh, business partners not so much the, the warm and fuzzy relationship between a father and daughter, but she really becomes indispensable in a role that's somewhat like his assistant ambassador, or even what we would consider a, a protocol officer at the State Department today. And with her skills in Russian, she can act as a liaison between the Americans and the Soviets as they are making the arrangements for Yalta um, and handling some of these uh, lesser seen but vitally important issues of diplomacy that uh, are necessary to make sure that everyone feels respected and uh, one of these roles where if something were to go wrong, you would notice her presence, but because she did such a good job, uh, she almost doesn't get the praise that she deserves. Finally, Anna Roosevelt, uh, who is the oldest of the three um, at 38, she's a mother of three. And of the three women, she has the least experience in politics and uh, foreign policy specifically. Her training was as an editor. Uh, she and her husband, John Bodiger, run the Seattle Post Intelligencer. And it's only after her husband joins the army that Anna decides to move back home to the White House. And this is this very personally important for Anna because she and her father had a very close relationship when she was a little girl. She has these wonderful memories of riding on horseback with him through the fields and the forests around their home in Hyde Park with a shared love of the natural world. But it was after his paralysis that she really becomes very distant from him. Uh, the needs that he has at the time kind of leave very little room for her. And so she sees this as a chance to recapture the memories of childhood with her father. But once she arrives there, she realizes something about him is not quite right. He is not as sharp as he once was. He's staring off into space for long periods of time. And she's very concerned. Her mother, Eleanor, doesn't seem to realize anything is amiss, but Anna uh, insists that he has a comprehensive medical examination, and it reveals that he is dying of congestive heart failure and only has a short time to live. And so Anna, keeping this secret, uh, FDR doesn't want to know anything about his health and he doesn't ask. Eleanor similarly doesn't want to know, can't bring herself to see that something has changed. So Anna carries this burden of the secret of his health and tries to really become his gatekeeper, uh, determining who should have an audience with him, who can meet with someone else, sometimes taking papers out of his inbox and distributing them to others who can handle them so he doesn't have to be bothered, really trying to save him as much as possible. And uh, when the time comes for Yalta, even though FDR doesn't know the state of his health exactly, he must sense that something is different. 
because he cables Churchill and says, if you're thinking of bringing Sarah again, I'm thinking of bringing Anna to this conference. This is not a role she'd ever been asked to play in his life before, but off she goes to Yalta with him, really protecting him as much as possible, both from himself and from himself and from others who want to meet with him. And so through the eyes of the, these daughters at Yalta, we can see a much more personal side of this history where the personal and the political are intimately intertwined. At the core of this conference, it's really a story of relationships, relationships among nations, relationships among leaders, and these relationships between these fathers and daughters that have long gone underappreciated. We can see through Anna's eyes the fervent belief that FDR has that he can make this personal breakthrough with Stalin to bring the Soviets into the international community once the common enemy has been vanquished. And you can see also the tragedy of how he tries and tries, but this is ultimately unsuccessful. You can also see the, the struggle that Anna has as his daughter, knowing that the end is near and there's nothing she can do, um, but also how this is frustrated. Her, she, her attempts are frustrated um, by her own father who kind of keeps everybody at an arm's length. And she even goes so far as to say, uh, he knows no man and no man knows him. And even his own family doesn't know anything about him. And you can see this in the, the way that he does operate someone enigmatically um, he keeps the Secretary of State, Edward Stettinius, at an arm's length. He's very skeptical of involving the State Department and really wants to conduct policy and uh, diplomacy in a very personal way. And unfortunately, in the case of Stalin, this doesn't work uh, terribly well. Through the late night conversations at Yalta between Kathleen Harriman and uh, Avril Harriman, you can see how frustrated Avril Harriman has become at this point with the policy pursued by Roosevelt. He's significantly more skeptical about the Soviet intentions and their willingness to keep their word after Yalta. And though his views are much more in line with Winston Churchill at this point, there's very little he can do because he is the representative to Franklin Roosevelt. And finally, through the eyes of Sarah, you can see a, a different side of Winston. I think people like to focus on statements he makes, like, if only I could dine with Stalin once a week, we'd have no trouble. But there's a much more nuanced view that he has of Stalin and their willingness to continue this alliance after the Kahneman en enemy is gone. Through Sarah's eyes, you can see the real trepidation he has at this time, both about his fraying relationship with FDR, as well as the, the willingness of Stalin to truly cooperate. And even though he goes home from Yalta making these statements in a very positive way about the success they have had at Yalta, that's not really the case of what he feels inside. Sarah is a window into the soul of Winston at this time and really a, a a sort of conscience of the conference. She says that she walks with him in silent step, understanding his thoughts, even the ones that he leaves unsaid. And you can see this in the way that she writes to her mother about her superstitions at the conference, kind of deriving this, this outlook from her father's trepidations. You can see it in the, the first meeting her father and FDR have when they meet at Malta she can sense something has changed and not knowing about his health, she wonders whether there's something wrong with him physically um, or if he's just moved away from this warm and uh, close relationship he and Winston Churchill had had. Through the late nine conversations that Sarah and Anthony Eden and Lord Moran, Churchill's doctor have kind of acting as a, a privy council of sorts at Yalta, you can see Sarah trying to channel the, the emotions and frustrations her father has in a productive way before they go into the conference room uh, to discuss the important issues at hand and really trying to channel these thoughts into the best version that they can be. But Sarah is also very important in this role that she plays with her father because she is a connection to the regular people and the sense that they have as the world is changing in a way that her father really can't see. Through her work as a WAF, she interacts with different types of British people all the time, um, her various colleagues who have different backgrounds, and she can feel the shifting sands of domestic politics and the sense that they have of having given so much and sacrificed so much during the war, which they were very willing to do. But in the post-war world, there's a, a, a different expectation and a different need that they had that her father doesn't yet recognize. And Sarah also has an opportunity at Yalta to go with the, the other two daughters and visit the local community and to see the regular people in the Crimea whose lives have been devastated by this war and whose futures are in the hands of her father and the other fathers who are you know, debating with Stalin in the conference room. And after witnessing this devastation, Sarah returns home and uh, to Lavadia Palace after Churchill has had a long day of tussling with Stalin over the future of Poland 
and they express their anxieties to each other. And Winston says to Sarah, I do not suppose that, that at any moment in history has the agony of the world been so great or widespread. Tonight, the sun goes down on more suffering than ever before in the world. And so at the end of Yalta, even though the three leaders dispatch a, a triumphant cable proclaiming the success of the conference and Churchill goes home to sell his colleagues on you know, what is a very optimistic outlook, what he says publicly is not necessarily what he feels inside. And perhaps the most honest unvarnished view into his soul and his outlook on the future is just at the end of Yalta when Sarah and Winston are standing on the ship, the HMS Franconia, looking out at the destroyed city of Sevastopol that Sarah see, saw with the other daughters uh, during the conference. And she turns to her father and asks him if he's tired. And he says, strangely enough, no. And yet I have felt the weight of responsibility more than ever before. And in my heart, there is anxiety. And so you can see these two sides, the public and the private views of Winston Churchill and his, uh, his anxiety about the future and the relationship with the Soviet Union through the eyes of Sarah in a more personal way than we have been able to see before. Well, thank you, Catherine. That, that, that really is a, a fascinating look and a, and, a, and a great lens through which to approach Yalta. Um, it, it, it's, it's a fascinating topic and there's much more uh, in, in your book. You've just, I wish we could spend two hours talking just about this, um, but we will now turn to uh, Professor Reynolds who will, will pick up the discussion um, and, and take us from Yalta uh, as a starting point and then on into Fulton uh, and beyond. So uh, I'm pleased to, to welcome, uh, in some ways, virtually at least, back to Westminster College. Uh, I believe you were here in 2002 as a Tyler Fellow, uh, and um, it's great to see you uh, again. Uh, Professor Reynolds <clears throat> is uh, also with uh, Christ College at the University of Cambridge, uh, and I, as I mentioned, uh, his recent book, The Kremlin Letters, Stalin's Wartime Correspondence uh, with Churchill and Roosevelt, is, is, is a must-have uh, resource for understanding the relationship between um, the three men. I think as, as Catherine's book is about the, the three daughters uh, and, and David's uh, captures very well the intimate in some ways correspondence between the three, the three, the big three readers. So um, David, welcome back. Thank you, Tim. And um, let me just uh, put up my screen. Here we are. So um, I think what I want to say is it follows on rather well from what Catherine's talked about, though we haven't um, had a conspiracy about plotting the two talks. Um, uh, I want to follow on from what she said by talking more about the aftermath. Um, but she has set up what, what I want to talk about very well. And as you can hear from just that brief preview in her book, this is a fascinating uh, new impression of the conference and of what goes on behind the scenes and uh, certainly something if you're looking for a Christmas present for deserving relatives or indeed undeserving relatives it's well worth uh, purchasing so I don't get a commission on this but I'm just saying so I want to talk about Yalta to Fulton via the unthinkable and some of you will know what I'm talking about others will find out hopefully in a few minutes um so uh, Catherine has shown us um, two uh, pictures of Yalta, one rather grim faced and another not so grim. This is one that um, I am particularly fond of, a uh, much more cheerful picture when, after the formal photos have been taken. Um, and as Catherine said, uh, it, if we just focus on Poland, this is a, a problematic conference. Um, but Roosevelt and Churchill knew it was going to be problematic. Uh, Roosevelt said, bearing in mind that the Red Army was already in occupation of Poland, um, he said to senators before he left uh, Washington, D.C., you know, the only thing we can do is try and ameliorate the situation, make it better, ameliorate it. Churchill said before he left in one of his gloomy moments, there's nothing I can do for poor old Poland. Um, they fought their best, but they knew that what they'd got on Poland was one that reflected the fact that Stalin held the best cards. But on the other hand, as Catherine said, Yalta is about other issues as well. On Germany, Churchill fights his, his corner very hard. He blocked Soviet demands for um, reparations uh, payments, uh, agreement on reparations payments. 
uh, much to Stalin's uh, irritation, he uh, is able to postpone issues about the dismemberment of Germany. Uh, and Roosevelt gets um, what he wants, which is um, looking ahead to American entry, uh, 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 Russian entry into the uh, Pacific War and uh, bringing the Soviet Union into what he called it around the family circle into the United Nations. Now we can debate the pros and cons of those policies, but the point I'm making is that these men leave Yalta, each of them, I think, with the feeling they had gained something, they'd got something. In other words, Yalta had a sense of this being in the round, a diplomatic negotiation in which there was give and take, as Roosevelt admitted to the Congress. And the intention, of course, was that these three would meet again uh, uh, at the end of the war with Germany to continue the planning of uh, peace. So a, a, a meaningful uh, conference. But one in which the stakes are high and Roosevelt and Churchill, it's quite remarkable the degree they go to when they come home of trying to sell what's happened, particularly over Poland, to a skeptical Congress and uh, in part a hostile House of Commons. And uh, whatever Churchill's concerns and fears, as Catherine has said in private, he goes OTT about um, some of the, uh, of what's been gained and what that uh, agreement on Poland is about. And in particular, the possibility of trusting the Soviets. So he says to the Commons um, that he comes back from Yalta with the feeling that Stalin and the Soviet leaders, as far as they're concerned, their word is their bond. And he goes even further with a meeting of ministers um, on the 23rd of February 1945. And I put the words up on the screen because they are quite remarkable. Uh, Paul Neville Chamberlain believed he could trust Hitler. He was wrong. But I don't think I'm wrong about Stalin. And I think those comments are worth pondering for a moment because he is very much a split personality. As, as, as Catherine has, has said and has brought out very insightfully with regard to Sarah, uh, Winston has deep doubts about this. He is, after all, a man who uh, campaigned against Bolshevism, uh, what he called the foul baboonery of Bolshevism, all through his life since the end of, of, the, of the First World War. But he was quite clear in June 1941 that any enemy of Hitler had to be an ally of Britain. And he has put his money into that. And this whole relationship with Stalin was not one in any way that he could have imagined when he became uh, prime minister. On May the 10th, uh, he becomes prime minister. Five days later, in 1940, his basic expectation about fighting the war, the French, the alliance with the French, falls apart. Uh, and from then on, Churchill is having to improvise. Everything about his wartime achievements is, if you like, an improvisation from a starting point that uh, he, he never expected in May, June 1940. And that's part, I think, of his achievement. Um, so what he ends up with, I think, are two special relationships. The obvious one is the natural one is with Franklin Roosevelt. Natural because uh, of uh, the uh, bond of the common language, the fact Churchill is half American, um, the closeness of the cultural relationships between the two countries. The unnatural one, but necessary one, is uh, an alliance with the devil, if you like, with the, with the Soviet Union, with Stalin. There they are together in August 1942. Um, and uh, Churchill, all through the war, wrestles with the enigma of the Soviet Union and of Stalin in particular. And uh, the fact that he can get messages from Stalin which are very cordial and messages from Stalin which are really uh, abusive and rude and, and so on. And he, in trying to understand this man, he comes up with the notion of what I call the two Stalins. 
And to illustrate it, here's a message he sends to the Foreign Secretary, Anthony Eden, in um, uh, March 1943, referring to two telegrams he's got on the same day, the 15th of March. One of them, uh, very cordial, thanking him for uh, sending a film about the Battle of Alamein and all the rest of it, um, promising a film about Stalingrad. The other, really blunt and really aggressive about why there's been no second front. And Churchill says, that these two telegrams, these contradictory telegrams, reinforce his sense that there are two forces to be reckoned with in Russia. Stalin himself, personally cordial to me, Stalin in council, a grim thing behind him, which we and he have both to reckon with. So Stalin and I get on personally, one-on-one, -on -one, but behind Stalin, there are these dark forces in the Kremlin, uh, the Politburo, the Red Army Marshals, whatever it is, nobody quite knows, uh, which constrain him. Now, that is not an image that uh, most historians of the Soviet Union would, would countenance today, but that is part of what Ro uh, Churchill uh, comes up with to try and understand the challenges of dealing with Stalin. And also, I think, uh, is a way to persuade himself that what he's doing makes sense um, because it goes so much against the grain of him as an anti-Bolshevik, the feeling that Stalin is, all things considered, a kind of moderate in the Kremlin constellation of forces, if you like. Um, so it's this positive sense of Stalin, the man that if he can, as uh, Catherine mentioned, you know, is Stalin, he says in January 1944, if Stalin, only Stalin and I could meet once a week, there would be no trouble at all. We get on like a house on fire. That's one of the positive quotations. At other times, he's extremely bleak about the whole relationship, but he has no choice. And that's the point I'm making. Leadership in adversity, which is the theme of our conference, is about making the best of a bad situation, or as somebody else said more in a more uh, um, contemporary idiom, you don't choose your inbox. You have to deal with the problems that are on your desk. And that's what Churchill is trying to do. And that's part of the, of the greatness of a leader is actually to be able to try and make something out of a really bad situation. Okay, so um, there they are at Yalta. That's a, 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 a chummy picture of Stalin even in his platform heels slightly shorter than Winston. Um, and if you want to pick up more about what I've just been talking about, the uh, Kremlin letters is, which I did with a Russian colleague, Vladimir Pachartnov, and that was a wonderful experience for a Russian historian and a British historian to work together at a time when neither of our countries are getting on very well together. Um, and then the chapter on Yalta in the book I wrote about summits, there's more detail about the, the, what I'm saying there. But let me move on then from Churchill coming back from uh, Yalta, trying to sell, <laughs> fingers crossed, that deal. The problem is that very quickly it's clear that the situation in Poland is deteriorating. The Red Army are taking control. The so-called Polish Committee of National Liberation, uh, which is a, Warsaw, um, a Moscow front organization of communists, is uh, taking control of the, of the political government behind the Red Army. Um, and um, the deal that had been made about a, a, a coalition government and free elections was always very vague. Uh, uh, Admiral Leahy, Red Sox chief of staff, said it was elastic, uh, highly elastic, and Stalin is stretching it uh, as far as he wants in March uh, 1945. Churchill writes to Roosevelt in growing agitation uh, on the 8th of March, 1945, that he felt that Poland is the test case between us and the Russians of the meaning which is to be attached to such terms as democracy. But Roosevelt is still focused on that bigger picture that Catherine mentioned, the importance of keeping the alliance going, the fight to fight uh, Japan to form the, the United Nations, um, uh, the inaugural conference is coming up in April, um, and he doesn't want to bring matters to a head. So in uh, early April, he retreats to Warm Springs, his um, uh, cottage in Georgia, and he's there he is uh, working on the keynote address that he is going to deliver to the 
inaugural conference of the, of the United Nations in San Francisco on the 25th of April. That is the image of Roosevelt uh, in early April. And those are the headlines on the 13th of April, uh, the day after Roosevelt's death. Truman takes over the Ninth Army, US Ninth Army is crossing the Elbe River nearing Berlin. So just at the climax of the war, uh, the alliance, if you like, is unhinged. Unhinged in the sense that I think both those two men, Churchill and Roosevelt, relied in certain ways on each other. The relationship's different in 45 from what it was in 41, but it's a part, it is still a partnership. There are times when Churchill pushes Roosevelt onwards. There are times when Roosevelt says to Winston, look, don't make the drama out of every crisis every day. And I think for Churchill, it's a really unsettling moment. And I'll come back to that uh, it just uh, in a, a minute or so. So Churchill soldiers on, there is the moment of triumph, 8th of May, 1945. There he is in Whitehall, wonderful picture. You, know, you, know, you can just see the hat right in the middle of the sea of, of, of happy people. Um, but on the 12th of May, uh, he writes to Truman, the new president, uh, uh, an iron curtain is drawn down upon their front. Uh, he says, Surely it is vital now to come to an understanding with Russia or see where we are with her before we weaken our armies. And his recipe, his remedy is, this can only be done by a personal meeting. In other words, we need to talk to Stalin again. That is the only hope of trying to deal with this situation. That's Churchill's uh, policy uh, in, in all this. And given where you are, where the Red Army is in 1945, there seems to be no alternative to that. No alternative to trying to negotiate on Poland with the Soviet Union. Or is there no alternative? In the middle of May, Churchill suddenly starts to think the unthinkable. That's the uh, top page of a top secret report by the joint planning staff to uh, Churchill on what they call uh, Operation Unthinkable. Churchill has asked them to develop a contingency plan for how to get a square deal for Poland by the use of force, not negotiation. And the planners take a deep breath. They say this is totally crazy, but they tell him that it would be possible to muster perhaps 40 or so uh, British and American divisions uh, in Germany to drive uh, east around Dresden and with support up the Baltic coast, naval and air support, and force the Red Army back. But they also warn if our political object is to be achieved, the defeat of Russia in a total war will be necessary. In other words, this is not going to be a limited war. It will escalate the total war. The result is not possible to foresee, but to win it, it will take, would take us a very long time. We must envisage, the planners say, a worldwide struggle. In other words, if you want to do this, it's World War III. Churchill recoils in horror. Um, he now asks what actually is there to stop the Red Army getting to the channel. Uh, and the whole planning document is put in the archives with the code name Operation Unthinkable. And if you're interested in pursuing it, you can just Google it from the National Archive in London's website, and you can see some of the documents that I, the documents that I just put up. So let's just pause again then, rather with, as I did with that um, comment that Churchill made about Neville Chamberlain in, in February 1945. Um, how do we explain this demand for a contingency plan for war against a country that was our ally less than two weeks before, using the forces of the former enemy? Because one of the premises is that we will have to use German manpower. I mean, this is really unthinkable. And it seems to me that this is testimony first to how exhausted Churchill is from five years of war. And that's clear from 
the diaries of Lord Moran, his, his, his doctor, the comments of Edward Bridges, the cabinet secretary. This is a man who is really worn out. Um, it's also testimony to his frustration at not being able to get the deal for Poland. And as Catherine said, Britain entered the war officially in, in, in September 1939 to, in support of Poland. And Churchill does feel this as a debt of honor. He uses that phrase at Yalta. Um, and also at the deepest level, um, uh, a feeling I think for Churchill that May 1945, if he looks back over those previous four, five years, this is not the outcome of that struggle that he embarked on as prime minister. This is not the outcome he ever wanted. A divided Europe, a hostile Europe, teetering on the edge of conflict again. I mean, there must be a huge sense of desperation. And some of what I'm talking about here, and I think what Catherine talked about earlier, suggests the, the sense of triumph and tragedy that Churchill feels for himself, as well as for, for Europe and for Britain at the end of the war. So over the next um, uh, few months, Churchill soldiers on, but he finds that Truman is increasingly uh, uh, determined to do his own thing. Here we are at Potsdam in July 1945, another sort of happy scene, three leaders. Um, uh, but basically, Churchill is now marginalized. Uh, Truman and his Secretary of State, Jimmy Burns, are sorting out a deal over German reparations and Polish borders with the Russians and putting the British on the side. And of course, a few days later, the removal vans are there outside Downing Street because Churchill has lost the election. And uh, for those of you who are listening from America, of course, it's worth remembering that you have a, a leisurely two months or so transition. In Britain, it's pretty brut brutal. If you lose the election, you're out the next day. And it, it, Churchill has nowhere to go. And he has to be, uh, he's, he's uh, helped by his, um, his uh, daughter, Diana, who, and her, her, her husband, who provide the accommodation while he's, he and Clementine are looking for somewhere to live. So this is a pretty bad time. Nevertheless, Churchill is Churchill. He gradually recovers. He's helped by a, um, a trip to Italy. He's helped by the therapy of painting. And uh, by the way, that was an absolutely wonderful talk yesterday, that session about painting and, and really enjoyed it. But it testifies to the power of painting for Churchill as a leader faced with adversity. Um, and then there are other things. He gets a, uh, some lots and lots of speaking invitations. And one of them catches his fancy, uh, uh, give a speech in the United States. Um, now, I don't wish to be in any way disrespectful to our friends at, um, at Fulton, but uh, at this stage, Westminster College is not quite as famous as Harvard or Yale. Um, but, and it is in the middle of the country. Even worse, as far as Churchill is concerned, it's a Presbyterian college and a dry campus. Nevertheless, Churchill decides to go because of the postscript on the letter that he will be introduced by the President of the United States. And there's the famous picture. There's Truman with his mortarboard on sitting beside Churchill. And the point of that for a man who has been thrown out by the British public, um, in his view, uh, is that this will be a chance to resurrect himself as a leader again. So just finally, I want to go through those, those, that speech because uh, when I think Alan Packwood introduced it, he referred to the famous words um, and here they are. And I've got the annotated copy of Churchill's speech here, courtesy of the indefatigable Alan, um, provided by the Churchill Archive Center. Um, there's the line about the Iron Curtain sending across the continent. But Churchill has other things to say in that speech and it's worth remembering them and because they pick up some of the things I talked about earlier. Um, uh, first of all, he says that it's important that there is no appeasement, no appeasement of uh, uh, the Soviets. Uh, what is needed, he said, is a settlement and a settlement early. Uh, mustn't delay it. How do we get a settlement? Um, he says, the Russians, there is nothing they admire as much as strength and nothing for which they have less respect 
than weakness, especially military weakness. And these annotations, by the way, are made by Joe Sturdy, his secretary, um, in the light of what he said uh, in, at, at the, in, at, the um, at Fulton. Um, so not strength, not weakness. Where do you get the strength? This is a, now Britain is a, a, a financially weakened uh, a country after the war, uh, no longer such a great power as it was. Answer Churchill emphasizes the special relationship, a special relationship, a term he started to use in 1943 between the British Commonwealth and the Empire and the uh, British Commonwealth and Empire and the United States. In other words, that combination will give the strength that's needed to deal with the Soviets. Deal in the sense of fighting them? No, Churchill says. What we must now do is to reach a good understanding at all points with Russia under the authority of the United Nations, supported by the whole strength of the English-speaking world. And then the title that he finally comes up with on the train on the way to Fulton, he says, there is the solution which I respectfully offer to you in this address to which I have given the title, The Sinews of Peace. The Sinews of Peace. That was Churchill's title, not Iron Curtain. And it's a play on, I think, on the adage that money is the sinews of war. What he's saying is negotiation from strength is, represents the sinews of peace, the muscles, the, what gives peace its strength. Um, so that, I think, brings us back to some of the things he said to Truman in that uh, letter of uh, uh, telegram of, of 12th of, of May, 1945. And it reminds us that Churchill, if you like, looked into the abyss in the middle of May with Operation Unthinkable. And he decided that uh, the unthinkable was, uh, was not acceptable. So when he comes back to power in, 19, in the 1950s, he is talking about picking up the threads of the relationship again. He uh, introduces this phrase, parlay at the summit. Uh, parlay is sort of some wonderfully sort of Shakespearean word, really. It's not easy to see how matters could be worsened by another parlay at the summit. And at the House of Commons, just after he becomes prime minister, he says in 19, November 51, that he, we need a supreme effort to bridge the gulf between the two worlds, between the you know, two blocks, um, to uh, move on from the frightful waste of Cold War. Never must we admit that a third world war is inevitable. So that's why I want to close, but just to remind you that, of course, summits is another word that is a word that we still use in conversation all the time about international relations. Um, and it, it does underline the fact that this man who was a great war leader was also a great wordsmith. If you think of, of these three phrases, Iron Curtain, Special Relationship and Summit, they're all part of the lexicon of diplomacy to the present day. Churchill was a believer in words, in the power of words. As he said in 1938, words are the only things that last forever. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, David. And um, I certainly agree. Uh, and all of us here who live with the uh, echo of that speech that seems to be resonating in the gymnasium, the historic gymnasium on this campus where the Sinews of Peace address was given 75 years ago, um, believe in, in the power of words too. Um, you both have, have presented a terrific look uh, at Yalta and beyond. Uh, and you have generated a, a great deal of questions that have been coming to me uh, from around the world. Uh, so I think in, in the time that remains, uh, I'd like to uh, talk about some of these questions that have come up and continue our conversation. Uh, we've titled this session from Yalta to Fulton to today. And, and hopefully in the time that remains, we can talk a little bit about the today part uh, of, of, of the legacy of these two uh, great moments, Yalta and, and the speech here at Westminster College. Uh, but the first question is, is from the UK. It comes from Elliot. Uh, and it is, um, how important in general terms was it for Churchill uh, to be accompanied by a member of his family when he was traveling? Uh, the, the Yalta conference and Sarah was not the only time that someone from his family traveled with him. And, and maybe you can, you, can, you can address that. Um, yes. So, uh... 
early in the war, the Churchills as a family decided that whenever Winston would travel abroad, he would travel with a, a member of his family as well, uh, partially as kind of a protector and confidant. So he would have a, a trusted audience to reveal the, the deep anxieties that he had. Um, but also the, the Churchills were very aware that they would be important to history and wanted to have someone at his side as a, an almost unofficial family historian as well to make notes and to write letters and just collect the, the memories of what was going on, not just in the conference room for the official record, but also surrounding it. Various members of his family acted in this capacity throughout the war. Um, the reason why he often turned to his children is also um, because Clementine Churchill was very afraid of flying. She tried to avoid it as much as possible. Um, Sarah goes with to both Tehran and Yalta, Mary, of course, to Potsdam. And uh, Randolph Churchill also kind of makes a, a brief appearance at both of these two uh, conferences as well. Um, and so it, it's kind of this twofold, you know, protector, confidant, but also uh, official record keeping, which I think is really interesting, kind of their self-awareness of their place in history as they were living through it. And of course, Sarah traveled um, to the United States um, when Churchill came before the Iron Curtain speech. Uh, he traveled first to New York, uh, then spent uh, a goodly amount of time in, in, in January and February in Miami Beach, uh, where a lot of his thoughts and words, words matter even more when you're on vacation on the beach, uh, I suppose, uh, for Churchill. And he, he used that much needed time to relax and refresh. And I believe Sarah joined, joined them there, did not make the trip to Fulton, uh, regrettably, until much later. Sarah did come to Westminster College uh, many, many years after, but um, no, that's, that's, that's terrific. And, 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 and David, a question for you. Um, someone, someone asks, rightfully, words, words matter, and to the today part of this, someone asks, uh, I think the bold question we're often asked here, what are the Iron Curtains of today? Uh, you know, in, in geopolitics, you know, the Cold War is, is over uh, in, in many respects. But as, as someone said to me last week, it's feeling chilly and they weren't talking about autumn. Uh, they were talking about the current climate. And, and, and perhaps you can, you can use your, your knowledge and history, as an historian and, and how history matters to, to, to address that question. I know you've written about the special relationship uh, today, uh, but perhaps tackle that question for us that is very thoughtfully sent us uh, by, by Jacob from Westminster College. Right. So what are the Iron Curtains today? Yes. Um, no, it's a good question. Uh, uh, and I think I might go to it through also the question of what can leaders meeting face to face do about those iron curtains. Um, both Churchill and Roosevelt had profound belief in the power of personal diplomacy and personal relationships. And of course, I think it's true of most politicians who get to the top. They get to the top because they are actually good in one way or another with people, either with arm twisting in private and cajoling or presenting themselves to the public. Um, and they were doing that in an age where it was possible to communicate with a, a larger audience relatively easily through the mass media, uh, through radio and television. And they were also doing it just at the stage when air travel had made it possible to go and meet with other leaders in a way which didn't take out weeks of your time. Um, uh, Neville Chamberlain, I think really the first person who did this, going to see Hitler, which was an absolute bobsmacking moment for most people, the idea that he was going to fly and talk to the German chancellor. Now, my point in making all this, saying all this is that it's not clear to me that the kind of problems we're now dealing with are so susceptible of that kind of personal intervention, both dramatically, imagine Nixon's trips to China and Russia in 1972, or um, in terms of making breakthroughs with leaders. Um, if you think of the recent summits that um, Donald Trump has had, I mean, with both um, uh, Kim Jong-un and uh, Putin, uh, both of those in summer of 2018, um, the Kim Jong-un one was largely theatrical, I think. It had no effective substance. It hasn't changed the relationship with North Korea. Um, 
uh, and the same with uh, relations with Putin. So you're dealing with questions really, I think that are in many cases less susceptible to personal diplomacy. And on the other hand, maybe more susceptible to alliance relationships. And so one of the concerns at the moment, I mean, Churchill is so emphatic in that speech about the importance of the cooperation across the Atlantic that he never envisaged in 1946 NATO, but that has been an important part of the future since, um, since his day. And that Western alliance, I think for many people is an important element which has become somewhat frayed in recent years. So I would put more emphasis on alliance relationships and perhaps less on personal diplomacy. Right. Well, thank you for that. And um, uh, Catherine, another question is, has come through f f for you um, that talks uh, and asks the simple question, did the daughters of Yalta know one another before the conference or was that the first time they met? Sarah Churchill and Kathleen Harriman did know each other quite well before Yalta. The Harrimans had lived in London between 1941 and 1943 and were very good friends with the Churchill family, as I mentioned, celebrating Kathleen's birthday the night they find out about Pearl Harbor. Kathleen was quite close with both Sarah and Mary. And um, of course, there's the, the relationship between Avril Harriman and Pamela Churchill, Winston's daughter-in-law, and Sarah, in, in an attempt to keep the peace in the family, helped Kathleen to cover up for the affair so that you know, Sarah's brother Randolph wouldn't find out about it um, in the interests of uh, peace for everyone involved. And so they did know each other very well. And Kathy had seen Sarah act uh, in some performances earlier in the war. Um, but they had never met Anna Roosevelt. Uh, Kathleen was very curious to meet Anna. Avril had met her on a trip to Washington, DC and reported back to Kathy that she was a quote, a peach. <laughs> and so she was very excited to meet her. But when Anna goes over to Yalta, this is the first time she's been in this type of environment. And even though she is the oldest of the daughters, she's the least experienced, especially in foreign policy, as the other two have been very much you know, a part of the conversation around the dinner table with their fathers since 1940 and 41. And so Anna, I think sometimes um, has a, a lack of self-confidence. Um, and even though she is the first daughter, the other, all the other delegates there, they know Kathy really well. All you know, the Russians, the British, the Americans, and so they almost defer to her as kind of the the, uh, the lead daughter in a sense because they are familiar with her. And Anna somewhat jealously guards its position and um, doesn't doesn't necessarily like Kathleen all the time. And uh, but I think that speaks more about their their respective sense of confidence uh, at the time. Kathy is completely oblivious to it and thinks everybody's wonderful. Um, so it's uh, really interesting to see the daughters. You think of them, you know, oh, they're the three women there, they must kind of be a united front, a united presence, but really their loyalties are to their fathers and to their nations and the relationships among them ebb and flow mirroring, mirroring the relationships among their fathers. Right, right. Um, that they all had their own special relationship uh, and a microcosm, um, not a macro. But that leads me to the next question, which is about this idea of the special relationship. Um, it's been mentioned many times in the conference. Uh, John Major mentioned it yesterday. Um, it was mentioned today by um, uh, the National Security Advisor O'Brien uh, in Washington uh, and talking about the importance and relevance. And, and, and while it's ebbed and flowed, that, that phrase has been used many times uh, in the last 48 hours to describe it. Um, it, it is there and it's important. Uh, this conference, this church is, is in ways a, a symbol of, of that special relationship uh, and the ability of the English speaking peoples as, as, as Churchill put it in the speech here uh, at Westminster College uh, to, to, to remain allies and be friendly on a cultural level, on a legal level, on a moral level. Um, what do we um, think you know, about the state of the special relationship uh, today? I know, David, you've written extensively on this, uh, mm. including a very thoughtful piece uh, a number of months ago um, in, in, I believe, the Wall Street Journal uh, about this topic. And, and with your book on the summits and the relationships of the various presidents, perhaps you can, you can, you can, you can give your assessment of, of the special relationship today. Okay. Well. I when I've tried to think about this, um, I, I, I try and break the word down because obviously it's used um, as a, uh, in a propagandistic way quite often, particularly by British governments. But it seems to me it's important to distinguish between set special in quality and special in importance. Um, meaning by that, 
uh, special in importance is, and it refers particularly to this Churchill Roosevelt period, the, um, the fact that although Britain was a junior partner in that relationship by the end of the war, Britain was still a global power with a, uh, a major navy, uh, a substantial air force, with conscription that lasted uh, into uh, the, through the 1950s, which meant that it was able to mobilize an army beyond its weight. Um, and still, though, with economic problems after the war, a major power economically. It's often forgotten that in say, 1952, British output is the same as France and West Germany combined. So Britain was still a global power. It also had bases all over the world, which mattered to the United States as America got into the Cold War. Now that specialness in importance has waned dramatically since the days of, 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 of Churchill. Um, nevertheless, there's specialness in quality, which is still there, was there in the war and is still there. Um, for example, the intelligence relationship, which has been mentioned during the conference, and is grow out of the of the sharing of intelligence during the war, that has continued uh, and is essential still to the the kind of structure of of Western relations and information sharing. Um, the nuclear relationship remains special in the sense that Britain has unusual access to American nuclear technology. Um, not something that, we, because we played a major part in the bomb project initially, uh, and then we've since later on acquired Polaris and then Trident um, technologies. Uh, and also most important, what I call the consultative relationship, which is the sort of fact, and this is where the common language does matter, the fact that British and American diplomats, service personnel, whatever, routinely uh, in the you know in the old days of landline posts, just pick up the phone and talk to Washington or to London, and just kind of get a sense of what the take is. And of course, one of the questions now with Britain moving into Brexit is whether um, the changing relationship with the continent of Europe in terms of economics and politics is going to affect that strategic relationship as well. But I would say that although the relationship is no longer special in importance in that global sense of the Churchill era, it's still important in quality in some of the ways I've just mentioned. All right. Well, well thank you. Thank you for that. Um, we have uh, just a, a few minutes remaining. And, and I think I'd like to just again thank, thank both of you uh, for taking time to join us uh, from Chicago uh, and from 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 the UK, this is a, an embodiment of technology that uh, I think Roosevelt and Churchill might have liked to have uh, yes. uh, <laughs> during the Second World War and, and afterwards. Though I think it is fair to say, as you suggested, David, that uh, real person-to-person -person summits are, are where the real work does get done. And we all look forward to returning to a time when we can have conferences. Churchill loved conferences, uh, and so do Churchillians. Uh, and we look forward to returning to a time when we can, we can join one another um, once again in person to have these types of conferences. But I'm, I'm very grateful uh, to you to, to be with us. Uh, and I would like to invite all of the viewers uh, to continue watching and, and thank the generous sponsors who've made this happen. Uh, and uh, if you uh, are still time to donate, uh, the concert has been, the, the conference has made free by the generosity of these sponsors, but uh, we're always looking uh, for, for additional support to, to, to produce educational programs, uh, not only here at Westminster College and America's Ch National Churchill Museum, but throughout the International Churchill Society um, um, uh, ally, Alliance. So we're, we're very much grateful of that. And one final plug um, for these books. If you haven't picked them up, um, David, your, your, your latest, uh, The Kremlin Letters, is, is, is a must-have. And of course, Catherine, your new book, uh, which you are uh, now Zooming uh, on a book tour, I suppose, everywhere, uh, The Daughters of Yalta. Please do pick these up. And I would be remiss also if I didn't um, make a, a short plug in the time that remains for another book that'll be released in two weeks, 
called The Inspiring History of the Special Relationship. Uh, that's a book that the museum is publishing by one of our Churchill Fellows, Nancy Carver, that examines this topic of the special relationship through the lens of the speech that we talked about today, through the lens of bringing this church from London uh, to Fulton in the 1960s and establishing the museum uh, and uh, the long legacy of the, of, of, of the relationship between the UK uh, dating back 400 years. So this is a new book that's coming out. I encourage you all uh, to pick up three books, not just two, uh, <laughs> but David's, Nancy's, and Catherine's to round things out. So uh, I will sh turn it over uh, back to, to our, our friends at Cambridge in London. We're going to be seeing uh, a number of short videos now uh, to continue this theme of international uh, relations by looking at some short videos produced by other Churchill groups throughout the world, uh, not just here in the United States uh, or in Britain, but other Churchillians uh, who are thinking about the legacy uh, and life of Winston Churchill, his legacy of leadership, uh, his words uh, uh, that do indeed uh, matter to this day. And once again, Catherine and David, uh, thank you. Uh, that's uh, all from here at Westminster College uh, in Fulton, Missouri at America's National Churchill Museum, Tim Riley, uh, director and chief curator. Thank you all for being with us today. Thank you. Bye-bye. I think at the moment that life is tough because you can only get a pint out of a pint bottle and therefore that means that there are only a certain amount of specific design jobs available. And the idea of a church or competition gives them the very first thought that they may have of using their talents to produce something within specific terms, which is commercial, because never forget that however brilliant a lot of these designers are, they have to earn a living. And I think what we're doing is helping them uh, on that route. You know, it's very, very important that students get a break and work to real briefs. And I think that's the thing that, you know, uh, cannot be underestimated. So to work on a real brief and, and maybe design packaging or design apparel or design footwear, whatever the case may be, is, is something that the students are, yeah, they're desperate for that. I took part in the Churchill competition in 2013. Back in 2013. 2014. In 2015. 2015. In March of 2019. So spring 2020. And I am in New York from New Zealand. And I'm in Athens right now. I entered the competition because my dad has always spoken about Churchill. He often quotes Churchill and I really didn't know much about him. So I used it as an opportunity to explore his life and then make an artwork about it. So I, what I did was I took um, some of the milestones from his life and decided to convey them in an animated video. And at that point I didn't really know much about digital animation, but I wanted to challenge myself as I felt that the brief was a great opportunity to kind of develop my skills. If you just graduated and not had any uh, professional projects as yet, entering this competition would give you the discipline and the organisational skills of um, researching an idea and then taking it to, to an end result and then submitting it to a deadline. And that's going to be a great discipline, it's going to look good in your portfolio. I think if you get shortlisted, it's going to be an incredible experience for you. If you overcome both those hurdles and you're lucky enough to be a winner, you will get the opportunity to work with an incredible design company and they will teach you so much and you will take that into your working life. I still have that I was a finalist on my CV. I think that's great. And also you meet loads of contacts. Penton as a whole could really open many doors for you. It was a great opportunity to get in the room with a lot of influential people. As a young designer who just graduated, um, the chances of me being in a room with the creative director of Pentland, Kay Greenia, yeah, the Paul Roger family and the Churchill family all in one sitting is impossible. And there's some tasty reward money if I remember. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> the journey towards the outcome was extremely uh, beneficial to me, I would say, because it was the first big 
design project I was working on, coming from an arts background, it really allowed me to develop those skills in a very fruitful way. I think the biggest learning that I had was just to really trust myself and trust when I feel passionate and excited about something to just follow that because you know things are clicking and that's when you're going to get the best outcome. You know, it could lead to full-time employment or it could launch them as a brand. I mean, that's the thing which is brilliant. And, you know, we've done quite a few competitions over the years, Arts Thread, but uh, Churchill, without a shadow of a doubt, is the, the new role now in that respect. The first professional thing that I ever did was the Churchill competition. It led me to the work placement that I did, which led me to the job that I had, which led me to the promotions that I had and the extra responsibility that I had to go through. It was the perfect start to how I envisioned my career to be moving forward. So it was, it was probably one of the most impactful things that I did. But I think my favourite project with Pentland was working with Canterbury where I basically illustrated the history of the brand in a, a kind of bio-tapestry way inside an old ice bath that was taken from the original Twickenham rugby ground and it's something I'm really proud of. Um, being hosted at Paul Roger, I was lucky enough to be hosted by them in their vineyard in Epernay in France, um, so that was really incredible. We did the activation for Red of the Glasses. Seeing you work in an environment where you've got all these people coming in looking at it and it can hold its own with the work of another designer who you really admire and appreciate, like it sits well with what they're doing and their vision and to be able to contribute to that. The competition gave me the confidence to pursue my dream to become a designer and it provided me with the experience to stand out from other graduates. The competition is so positive. It teaches people about Churchill and about his ethos. When you're going through hell, keep going. Because when you're entering into this career, it's not easy. And actually you'll get rejection after rejection. When you hear about Churchill and you hear about how his positivity and damn mindedness got him through, this is exactly the same attitude you need to have as a young designer. The Pendle and Churchill Scholarship contributed in three ways in my life and career. First, learning. My public policy research work during this program got selected to be presented to the advisor to Indian Prime Minister and the advisor to Chinese President in a joint meeting. Thanks to the professors and mentors of these two esteemed universities, that is New York University and University College London, also, uh, I'm thankful uh, to learn about the best practices of public policy in United States and United Kingdom during this program. And because of my knowledge and learning, I got, also got invited uh, to be part of consulting team of principal scientific advisor to Indian Prime Minister. The second way in which this scholarship contributed is uh, boosting my belief in my ideas and work because my public policy work done during the course got also selected by international organizations like Asia Development Bank and Asia Infrastructure and Investment Bank. And because of this self-belief, uh, uh, after seeing death of 15 uh, migrant workers during COVID, I started my new initiative called Worker Union Support uh, to empower 500 million blue and grey collar workers in India. And I am happy to share with you that within two months, I got support from 2,500 trade unions, which represent around 40 million workers. And I also uh, got selected uh, by NASDAQ's Entrepreneur Center for its circle programs because of social impact our startup was creating. And uh, Government of India also issued a, a certificate of recognition to our startup. The third way in which this scholarship contributed in my life is the mentorship and support we got from two gentlemen, Mr. Rubin. 
Chairman of Pentelen Group and Mr. Geller, Chairman of International Churchill Society. These two gentlemen are always eager and available to support us uh, in terms of resources, in terms of advice, in terms of connecting to the expert in different domain. So this is the biggest asset we got. It's not just uh, money. Uh, these kind of uh, profound network and support is, is always available to us by these two gentlemen. In conclusion, uh, I would say that as a Pentelin Churches scholar, we are fully aware that we are not only sharing resources or network or experience of Mr. Rubin and Mr. Geller, but we are also sharing their vision and responsibility to empower lives, to create social impact. And because of this, my new startup is aligned with their vision and responsibility to create social impact and improve lives. People around the world today who enjoy the freedom of the 21st century owe a debt of gratitude to the leadership of Sir Winston Churchill. Battling tyranny with smarts, insight, and courage, Churchill was the anchor for a better, reformed world in the last century and thus contributed to a freer, flourishing world in ours. Yet for some, knowledge of that accomplishment may be fading. For others, they may not be aware of his early deeds as a social reformer in Great Britain. Winston Churchill was a man of his time, but he was also ahead of it. Before facing the evils of fascism, Churchill much earlier fought for pensions, unemployment insurance, and a minimum wage for the sweated trades, the left out millions, as he called them. Churchill denounced an anti-Jewish bill that would have prevented immigration, Jewish immigration from Russia. He was critical of Boer racism, arguing, rightly, that South African blacks deserve legal equality with whites. And he was also critical of the discrimination against untouchables in India. Churchill fought for the advancement of freedom and equality of all peoples. He favored and fought for a free, flourishing world. But as the years progress, those with living memories of the great statesman pass on. The onus falls on today's generation to honor the legacy and accomplishments of Sir Winston Churchill. The Sir Winston Churchill Society of Calgary plans to do just that through the Churchill Leadership Initiative and Statue Project. Calgary, at the foot of the Canadian Rockies, is where Churchill visited in 1929 as part of his three-month North American tour, and it is where he painted some of his most sublime work. It is Calgary that will soon be home to the world's newest statue of Winston Churchill. The statue and a new speaker series will commemorate the admiration that Churchill had for Alberta and Canada that came from his 1929 visit. For example, on a clear day in August 1929, he stepped off the train in Calgary to gaze in awe at the glory of the Rockies and the beauty of the prairies before them. And as historian Andrew Roberts has noted, the only place that Churchill ever spoke of retiring to, apart from his home in Kent, was Alberta. Such was his love of the province and its sense of boundless possibilities. Also in 1929, Churchill visited Alberta's Turner Valley oil fields. He was enthused with the entrepreneurial energy he saw there. Also, that year of some historical irony, Winston told his wife Clementine that if Neville Chamberlain ever became prime minister, he'd move to Alberta to become a rancher. We are all fortunate that he broke that promise. Back to our century. While it is popular for some to hold historical figures in contempt, Churchill's dedication to human flourishing and freedom and progress is a timeless contribution worth remembering. We've initiated this project for multiple reasons to commemorate Churchill's 1929 visit and love for Canada, to honor his legacy and courage, and to introduce Winston Churchill to a new generation. Also, the statue is meant to pay tribute to the hundreds of Calgarians and the nearly 45,000 Canadians who fought and died in the Second World War to end tyranny. As part of the plinth, we will also remember our allies, over 382,000 Brits, and nearly 417,000 Americans who perished in the Second World War. We will recall the 240,000 Poles, 87,000 East Indians, almost 40,000 Australians, 57,000 Filipinos, 
and nearly 12,000 New Zealanders who also gave their lives. We will also remember the resistance fighters from Poland, France, Norway, Denmark, Greece, and other nations who were all also indispensable to the war effort. They all fought to win back lands from tyranny and to restore ordered liberty around the world. The Churchill Leadership Initiative and Statue Project is already underway with tremendous support. Renowned sculptor Danik Mozdensky from Edmonton has been commissioned to create the Churchill statue. His past work includes Sir Isaac Brock, Prime Minister Lester Pearson, jazz artist Clarence Horatio Miller, former Alberta Lieutenant Governor Lois Hull, and Alberta suffragist Nellie McClung. The Calgary Churchill Society is on track to erect the statue in a prominent public place by August 24, 2021, the anniversary of Churchill's visit to Calgary. If you admire the legacy of Sir Winston Churchill, please help us ensure future generations do so as well. You can do so by supporting a renewal of respect for Sir Winston Churchill and all that he represents, democracy, sensible compassion, courage, all wrapped in his stellar leadership. We seek no support from governments. The Churchill Society of Calgary aims to raise the money for the statue entirely from those who believe that the legacy and leadership of Sir Winston Churchill should be commemorated in Calgary. The Churchill Society of Calgary is a charitable organization and all donors will receive a tax receipt. To support the renewal and respect for Winston Churchill's courage, his leadership, his legacy, please look at our website at www.churchillcalgary.ca. Lastly, we wish to leave you with a thought from our patron, Randolph Churchill III. Thank you. Well, welcome back to Cambridge and welcome to the final session of our conference. I hope you enjoyed those videos which will hopefully have given you a taste of the, the work that the International Churchill Society is supporting around the world. But now is the moment of truth. Now is the moment where I can reveal the answer to some quiz questions. Indeed, where I should reveal the answer to, to some of the quiz questions we have asked you for prizes over the last two days. And I'm joined by uh, Andy, um, who's going to reveal the names of the winners. So yesterday, we asked you, what was the subject of the most expensive Churchill painting sold at auction? What was the subject, the subject of the most expensive Churchill painting sold at auction? And the correct answer was the goldfish pond at Chartwell. And that painting sold for a staggering £1,762,500 in 2014 at Sotheby's. It was part of the estate of um, the late and much missed Mary Soames. So we have three winners. And Andy, those names are? Thank you. I'm delighted to announce the first name is Richard Sanchez from Peru. The second name is Ian Lay from Canada. And finally, Michael Blevins from Virginia, Virginia in the USA. And each of those lucky winners is going to get a copy of Paul Rafferty's wonderful new book, Winston Churchill, 
painting on the French Riviera, which we showcased in that session yesterday. So our free winners will at least be able to look at pictures of a beautiful holiday location. Our second prize was for the Edwina Sands signed print. And if you remember, Justin Reich at the end of his session asked you how many times Churchill visited the United States. The correct answer was 16. And Andy, our lucky winner is? The lucky winner is Fleming from Copenhagen. And finally, Andy asked you earlier this afternoon for the other name by which Churchill's Iron Curtain speech is commonly known. The other name by which Churchill's Iron Curtain speech is commonly known. And the answer to that question is, Andy? Well, that qu the answer is the sinews of peace. And I am delighted to announce that Wendy Noble from Ontario was one of our winners, Richard Bell from Arizona, and then finally, Roger Kilshaw from Lancashire here in the UK. And those three lucky winners are all going to get a copy of Catherine Katz's excellent book, Daughters of Yalta, about which you've just been hearing. So congratulations to them all. We will be in touch with you to arrange delivery. And on that note, it's time to go to our closing keynote of the conference. But we're still hoping that there will be time at the end of this keynote for one or two questions. So if you want to get the last word in, email us now. We're on 2020 at winstonchurchill.org. But it's now my huge pleasure to introduce Lord Dobbs, Michael Dobbs. Michael says on his website that he has never had a proper job. It would be fairer to say that he's never stopped working. And like Churchill, he has worn many hats. He's worked with Margaret Thatcher and with John Major. He served as deputy chairman of Saatchi and Saatchi. He has been a newspaper columnist, a visiting professor. He is now a peer, but he has always been, first and foremost, a writer, a master of words. He's produced some 20 novels and secured some five Emmy nominations. I suspect that he is known best to all of us as the man who gave us House of Cards. But he's also written a series of four novels on Churchill's wartime premiership. So as a politician, as an author, he seems ideally placed to bring us the last word on Churchill in adversity, at least for this year and for this conference. And with that, over to you, Michael. Well, hello. Um... What an exceptional couple of days these have been. Alan and his colleagues have laid a feast before us. You know, we sometimes seem to live in an age of can't do, but Alan and his staff not only can do, but have done. And I want to thank them on your behalf for the success of this conference, which has been overflowing with politicians, painters, Paul Rafferty, a wonderful insight yesterday, uh, a prime minister, family, friends, academics and simple enthusiasts. Uh, I also must express thanks to our loyal sponsors whose abundant generosity has made this all happen. And of course, I want to thank you. We're all looking forward to the time when we can once again gather together, tell our stories and share our mutual interests. In the meantime, thanks to your support, this conference has been a superb substitute. And it's my pleasure to round it off. But who am I? A novelist, a creator of creatures from the dark side of politics to talk about Winston. Well, have a little pity. I fear the art of political fiction may have recently died. It simply can't keep up. Uh, yet it's the dark side that tells us so much about what motivates and makes a personality. In the past two days, we've focused on Winston's extraordinary strengths. Uh, but to close our proceedings, I want to look at his other side, the darker side, if you will, his vulnerabilities. 
and how he not only overcame them, but exploited them. The other day I was rereading what I think is Winston's first published writing. I suspect that many of you may not have noticed this gem. It's a poem. He published it at the age of 15 in the Harrow School magazine. Stunningly, it was about the ravages of, wait for it, the Asian influenza straight out of China. Yes, a plague that swept the world in 1890 and killed a million people. I don't know if any of this sounds familiar, but, oh, how shall I its deeds recount or measure the untold amount of ills it has done? From China's bright celestial land, e'en to Arabia's thirsty sand, it journeyed with the sun. Well, it's not exactly Shakespeare, but he was only 15. <laughs> and now Europe groans aloud, and neath the heavy thunder cloud, hushed is both song and dance. And more about loathsome hand and cruel sting, poisonous breath and blighted wing. His first published writing, extraordinary stuff, which helps, I think, remind us that by the time Winston came to his own hour of trial and destiny, he'd already lived through not only the Asian flu, but also later the Spanish flu, the First World War, the financial crash, the Great Depression, and so much else. He knew suffering, what it was about knew about it all, all too personally. As a novelist and playwright, and I'm just writing a new theatre play about Winston, all I need is some COVID-free theatre, some small stage, some place of players, I live in hope. But in the meantime, I'm fascinated by the many private miseries Winston endured throughout his life. Sometimes I think the histories are too polite. They gloss over so much of the difficult personal life that forged this extraordinary man. But for me, at least, it's the private circumstances that explain so much of the public persona. At his first school, for instance, when he was just seven, St. George's in Ascot, he was, to put no finer point on it, brutalized. I don't have time to go into too much of the appalling detail, but he arrived the youngest boy in the school and spent two years of hell. Yes, Winston could be a pain in the neck, a rebellious and troublesome child. And for those troubles, he was whipped by his headmaster so badly that his body bled. One contemporary of his wrote, it took only two or three strokes for drops of blood to form everywhere. The headmaster took an intense sadistic pleasure in these floggings. The objective was to break Winston, to beat him into submission, and the headmaster nearly succeeded. Winston became a sickly child, developed a nervous stutter. F -f 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 fight them on the Beaches? No, it wouldn't have been the same, would it? He suffered cruelly, yet his response was entirely characteristic of him. Imagine this child. He has been beaten until not just bruised, but he's blooded. It was intended to break him, to force him to submit. But that wasn't Winston. Instead, he broke into the headmaster's study and stole his hat, his prized straw boater that hung on the back of the door. And Winston took it down to the woods and then for one glorious afternoon, kicked the hell out of it until there was nothing left but straw. Not bad for a boy who was then just eight. Never, never, never give in. And I think in that eight-year-old boy, you can see some of the foundations for the 65-year-old Winston, all those years later, defying everything that the world could throw against him. 
And as we heard earlier today from Emma Soames, he tried so hard to rezone children in more loving surroundings than he himself knew. Churchill himself once wrote that famous men are usually the product of an unhappy childhood. I would go one step further and suggest that the great man and, that, and great men often have internal demons, forces within that drive them on, make them often obsessive. Public lives compelled by private miseries. I believe that to be an important part of the truth about Winston. His early family life was chaotic. His parents' marriage riddled with infidelity and absence. His father, Lord Randolph, was at times outrageously cruel towards Winston and others, and at times simply ignored him. One of the last letters to Winston that Lord Randolph wrote before he died was to tell his son that he was in danger of becoming, I have trouble reading these words, they are so out of order. Lord Randolph told Winston that he was in danger of becoming a mere social wastrel, one of the hundreds of the public school failures, and you will degenerate into a shabby and futile existence. He told his son not to reply because, and I quote, I no longer attach the slightest weight to anything you say. This was not a joyful childhood. Winston was often lonely, desperately unhappy. So how did Winston respond? Not with anger or rebellion, but by forgiving, by embracing, by putting the unkindness and neglect into a wider context. He built on his pain and turned it into something much, much finer. Almost as soon as he began writing, he set to work on a two volume biography of his father that shows nothing but admiration and unquestioning loyalty. Seeing the best, finding treasures hidden amongst the torment. Winston being such a fine historian had an ability to see beyond the pain and the heartache. He possessed a rare and remarkably wide understanding of the affairs of man. His career is littered with examples of tolerance and forgiveness and insight. His maiden speech as a member of parliament is one example. He reached out towards the Boers. Remarkable when we considered that only a year earlier the Boers had put a price in his head. Winston Churchill wanted dead or alive. And after serving in the trenches in France at Plug Street during World War I, he came back home in victory to plead for more lenient treatment of the German people. With the sole exception of Adolf Hitler, personal malice was never part of Winston's repertoire. He filled his first war cabinet with opponents, Chamberlain, Halifax, Attlee, Greenwood. He may not have liked them all, but he knew he needed them. He held close to that most profound of democratic truths, that others have a right to their opinions, no matter how foolish or misguided they may seem. And that higher virtue isn't achieved through higher volume, that success isn't guaranteed by listening to the sound of your own voice. It's getting others to listen to your voice that counts. So when Neville Chamberlain died some six months later. Neville embraced the differences, uh, Winston embraced the differences and gave the older Pisa one of the finest eulogies imaginable. History with its flickering lamp stumbles along the trail of the past, trying to reconstruct its scenes to revive its echoes. The only guide to a man is his conscience, the only shield to his memory is the rectitude and sincerity of his actions. Neville Chamberlain, Winston said of his old foe, acted with perfect sincerity. Remarkable words of forgiveness and inclusion. 
But it was more than the ability to forgive and to embrace that cemented Winston's approach. It was an instinctive understanding that politics was more than a game, even though it was a game he loved. He had an ability not only to thrash through the brambles in order to get the fruits that hung from the political tree, but also to go further, right to the roots. And those roots of democratic politics were the, were the people. His relationship with ordinary Britons was amazing for the grandson of a duke. Perhaps some of that very unaristocratic empathy goes back to the neglect he suffered from his parents in his early years, a uh, neglect that I hasten to add his mother Jenny more than made up for in her later years. Jenny, what a superb, complicated woman she was. But back to my point. Much of the happiness and consolation Winston found in his childhood centered around his nanny, Mrs. Everest, womany, for whom he held an abiding love. The woman who looked after him and tended all his wants and to whom he poured out all his many childhood troubles. It was she who introduced him to ordinary down-to-earth things during their long holidays with her family on the Isle of Wight. And so, uh, I'm making this up, but this is what novelists do, and just because I've made it up doesn't necessarily mean it's not true. And so, when Winston came to his moment of monumental adversity in May 1940, he was blessed with a deep understanding of the ordinary people of this country, both by instinct because of his deep emotional intelligence and through his profound love of an ordinary woman like Elizabeth Everest, which I think helped build the foundations of one of the finest speeches ever uttered in the English language. His first speech as prime minister on the 13th of May, 1940, as Hitler's panzers were overrunning Europe, snuffing out the flame of freedom and pushing the British army to the point of extinction. That moment, was the moment of greatest peril. Britain stood within hours of defeat. Had Halifax or any other conceivable contender replaced Chamberlain as prime minister, we would have settled, done a deal. Hitler would have won. But in one of those extraordinary whimsies that history throws at us, we got Winston. Impossible man, few friends, utterly unreliable. A man not expected to succeed. And perhaps that's why they chose him, to watch him fail and get him out of the way. He knew that the only way he could succeed was to take the people with him. Yet they'd been lied to repeatedly, promised peace in our time, peace with honor. Winston somehow had to build a new rapport with ordinary men and women if there was to be any chance of leading the country through the wilderness. So he took the extraordinary decision to trust them, trust the people with the truth. What an astonishing thing for a politician to do. So he made his speech. He trusted them with a truth that was both awesome and really rather terrifying. I have nothing to offer, he said, but blood, toil, tears, and sweat. Nobody other than Winston would have had the courage or insight to be so blunt, to promise them no alternative other than blood as the down payment for victory. And they responded because they knew he was giving them the truth. In the hour of this greatest adversity, he trusted the people. And that is why they stuck with him, even as he walked through the ruins of their homes that were still smoldering and smoking from the devastation of the Blitz 80 years ago. I suspect you've all seen the wonderful Gary Oldman playing Churchill in the darkest hour. Isn't it, isn't it strange? but also very telling that perhaps the most memorable moment of that film is 
when Winston climbs onto a tube train and has a conversation with ordinary men and women, draws strength from them, draws inspiration from them, so that he, in turn, could inspire them. Now, the tube train never happened, of course. It's preposterous. It's creative license. But it captures a truth that Winston's leadership was inextricably bound up with brave people. They stuck with him through thick and thin, well, till 1945 at least, and even then they still revered him, long enough for Winston to be marked as the greatest Britain that there has ever been. He achieved that status, not because he was perfect or because everything was easy, but because he was a man who learned from adversity and used its lessons to create an enduring echo amongst his fellow human beings, which makes him, in many ways, as relevant today as he ever was, a symbol of that most profound of political truths, that if leaders are to take nations through times of great adversity, they must take the people with them. Winston was a man not only of his own times, but I think for these times, and perhaps for all times. In supreme adversity, he shook history by the scruff of its neck. And in doing that, he gave us our futures. Thank you. Well, Michael, thank you very, very much for those superb remarks. It's wonderful to to hear one master of words talking about another. I'm hugely grateful to you for taking us back to the theme of the conference, Churchill in adversity, and talking about the personal adversity that he had to face. Um, we do have time, I, I think, for um, a couple of quick questions, um, if we may. Um, and the first one comes in from Daniel in um, Portland, Oregon. Um, and it's a question that I'm going to put a little bit of a spin on. Um, what Daniel asks is how we should go about training and educating the, the leaders of the future, the future Churchills and Roosevelts and, and so on. Um, so my spin would, on this would be, of course, that you, you've just brought out that Churchill's own education um, was, was, was one of... Uh, adversity um, and, and struggle. So do these future leaders, um, to be effective, um, do they have to be forged in adversity? That's a, uh, that's a very good question, Daniel. Thank you very much. Um, while I was talking about being forged in adversity and of all great leaders being forged in adversity and uh, often responding to their own inner unhappiness. I was also thinking of my time with Margaret Thatcher, another great leader in my view, uh, and one whose views and whose character I think was built by a lot of internal inconsistencies and difficulties that she had. Uh, and it, I think it was uh, Harold Macmillan, uh, auto, uh, Harold Macmillan's biographer who explained that Harold Macmillan had been forced onto the public scene by his private unhappiness. Um, this is a theme which seems to go throughout. So how do we go about making, creating great leaders? Well, not simply by making them unhappy. That's not the point of what I'm trying to say. Um, but all of those great leaders, and I think all of those great leaders we can think of, all had their roots deep in the past. They understood what had gone before. Now, yes, um, history if it doesn't repeat itself, at least it has a great echo of the past. And I fear that one of the things that gets in the way of leadership today and gets in the way of political dialogue today is that too many people who intervene in this Twitter world, in this world of social, social, um, social media, um, uh, simply believe that the world started this morning. To get anywhere, to resolve these huge problems that we have, uh, and we have great problems. Uh, you do need to have uh, un an understanding of human nature and of what went before. And the great thing that knowing about what went before gives us, I think, 
is optimism. Because you think we're in trouble now? Ah, look at what Winston went through. Look what anybody at the age of 100 today has gone through. And they stand as evidence that no matter what is thrown at us, we can get through it. So I'm, I'm a great optimist, and I think that all leaders ought to be optimists. So as a, a scriptwriter, as a novelist, how do you go about presenting Churchill to a generation that perhaps doesn't know that history? Well, my own personal approach has been guided very much by realising that I'm a novelist and there are great historians out there who understand and have written about Winston so extensively. What do I have to offer in that field? Well, um, as a novelist, I, I often want to look behind uh, the, the facade, uh, not simply looking at what they have done, but who they are. That's where novelists and dramatists start digging away at the the inner demons, the dark places within characters. And, and so uh, before I started looking at uh, what Winston had done and whether he was a great man or not, I wanted to know what made Winston tick. What got him up in the morning? What was he caring about? What was he uh, uh, ambitious for? What made him fearful? And for that job, and of course I never had the, the, the the huge privilege of being able to meet with Winston Churchill. But I read lots of reminiscences by his aides, by his assistants, by his secretaries, one that I particularly remember, uh, Elizabeth Nell, uh, whom I did have the great pleasure of meeting at the Imperial uh, uh, War Museum in the cabinet uh, war rooms. And, and she and so many of the others gave an insight to what he was like as a person. And we cannot understand the politician and the great statesman unless we're also able to get to grips with him as a person. And I thought that is where I, as a novelist, can actually bring something to the, the feast and, and be able to do what historians can't. Historians are bound by the facts, by and large, whereas I, as a novelist, can invent those facts if I want, but use instinct and instinct about what makes us tick and that's what novelists and dramatists do and so hopefully I've been able to fill in some of the gaps which the historians can't. Well Michael I think you've provided us with a wonderful feast and I hope you will go on providing us with more courses. Um, indeed how do we follow a, a presentation like that? I, I, I think there's only one way and that is with a member of the Churchill family. So for our closing remarks, we are going to hear now from Celia Sands, granddaughter of Sir Winston and the honorary president of ICS UK. She will already be known to many of you as an accomplished writer and broadcaster and as the author of several books about her grandfather's early adventures and later travels. Ladies and gentlemen, Celia Sands. Speaking to you today, locked down in London and broadcasting over the telephone, I'm reminded of my grandfather's wartime speeches. This conference has occurred against an unusual backdrop of world crisis, but also at the time of several crucial World War II anniversaries. The 80th anniversary of the Blitz reminds us that we have been through terrible times before. And the 75th anniversary of VE Day shows us that we can and we will come through them. What my grandfather offered was not just words, powerful and memorable as those were, but also inspirational leadership and firm action. I'm glad that this conference has focused on the importance of leadership and happy that it has discussed the lessons that can be learned from the past. Sir John Major, Lord Haig, Ambassador O'Brien, Catherine Katz, David Reynolds, and now Lord Dobbs have helped us gain new insights into leadership in adversity. But I'm also glad that we have celebrated the lighter side of Winston Churchill, the artist who painted in such brilliant colors and the family of man I knew behind the public figure. My sister Edwina, my cousin Emma, Sita Steltzer, Jane Williams, Noni Chapman, and Paul Rafferty have all helped provide an important alternative to those who just see Churchill as the bulldog warrior. 
that was not the Churchill that I knew. I have many happy memories of walking with him at, at Chartwell and feeding his beloved goldfish. But most of all, I was lucky enough to have traveled with him at the end of his life on a magnificent cruise in the Mediterranean on the Onassis yacht and several times in the south of France. That was particularly special for me as there I had to myself the grandfather that the whole world felt they owned. In 1962, the peace was quite literally shattered when grandpa fell and broke his hip. The general view was that he would not survive. I went with Anthony Montague Brown to the hospital where he looked incredibly frail and said to Anthony, I want to die in England. You will make that happen. Promise me, Anthony, that you will. As we walked back to the hotel, Anthony said, that is a promise I don't think that I'll be able to keep. The next day, we boarded the RAF ambulance plane that Prime Minister Harold Macmillan had sent, and all I could do was to hold his hand and hope and pray that he would make it. When we got to Heathrow, as he was lowered from the plane, he caught sight of a group of distraught airport workers. He gave them a smile and a fee sign. We all breathed a sigh of relief and realized he had made it and he lived for another year and a half. My grandfather may have thrived in adversity, but he also loved life and lived it to the full. He famously said, I am a man of simple tastes, easily satisfied by the best. I hope that next year we can celebrate that spirit together and in person. My thanks go out to the large team that has made this conference possible. To Andy, Craig, David, Derek, John, Justin, Catherine, Lee, Mitchell, Scott, Tim and Alan, and many others. They were all definitely working in adversity, and also to the sponsors, without whom it could not have happened. We are grateful for the support of Philip Bigman, Lawrence Geller, Gretchen Kimball, Ron and Eleanor Luke, Jean-Paul and Isabel Montupé, and Robert and Regina Mulheiser. But above all, I want to give you my thanks for joining us at this conference, if only virtually. I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you all for being with us. And that is not the beginning of the end. That is the end. Thank you to all our participants and speakers for giving so freely of their time and expertise over the last couple of days. Hopefully, we will be able to meet again next year. In the meantime, do check out the International Churchill Society website for events and information, not least because it's there that we will be posting links to all of the content that you viewed um, if you want to watch again. If you've enjoyed this event, um, do consider joining or supporting the organisation. But from Cambridge, thank you and goodbye.